Welcome to City Hall's Council Chambers for today's council meeting, September the 29th, 2015. We have a full complement of councillors uh, and we are ready to dive into our agenda. So I will start, uh, Madam Clerk, by asking you for the roll call, please. Mayor Robinson is in the chair, Councillor Louie. Councillor Stevenson. Here. Councillor Deal. Here. Councillor Jang. Here. Councillor Reimer. Councillor Meggs, Councillor Ball, Councillor Carr, Here. Councillor Affleck, Here. Councillor DiGenova. You have a call, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Madam Clerk. So welcome, everyone. Council, uh, first we have in-camera uh, motion to address. Council's required to meet in-camera later this week. The reasons and authority under the Vancouver Charter uh, are listed in the update agenda. We need a mover to go in-camera later. Uh, Councillor Deal moves, Jang seconds. All those in favor? Any opposed? And that carries. So that will start uh, shortly after this council meeting. And next up, we have minutes from our last set of meetings. Firstly, from the regular council meeting, September the 15th. Any corrections? A mover of receipt is Councilor Deal. And Jang seconds. All those in favor? Any opposed? And that carries. The second set of minutes are from the public hearing. Uh, July the 21st, 28th, and September 15th. Any corrections to those minutes? A mover. Councillor Deal moves. Seconder. Councillor Chang, all those in favor? Any opposed? And that carries. Minutes three are from the regular council meeting that followed the Standing Committee on City Finance and Services, September the 16th. Any corrections? And a mover. Councillor Meggs moves. Second by Councillor Chang, all those in favor? Any opposed? That carries. And our fourth set are from the public hearing uh, minutes on September the 17th. Any corrections to those? A mover, Councillor Deal moves, seconder. Who would be so bold? Councillor Stevenson will move, I uh, will second. All those in favor? Any opposed? And that carries. That is all the minutes from a few weeks back. And we need a motion to go into Committee of the Whole. Councillor Stevenson, Councillor Deal seconds. All those in favor? Any opposed? And that carries. We go into committee to consider the consent agenda items. We have one communication, one administrative report, eight policy reports, and two other reports on the agenda for consideration. And council may adopt the recommendations for these items collectively in a single motion. Does any member wish to hold one of these reports for debate, separate vote, or because of conflict of interest? Councillor Carr? Uh, yes. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Administrative Report 1, Policy Report 1, Policy Report 4, please. Okay, and anybody else have a report to hold? Seeing uh, none, I will uh, ask for a mover of adoption of the recommendations before Council in all the rest of the communications. Uh, well, that's one communication that is uh, Six policy reports and the other two reports. So all of the reports with the exception of A1, P1, and P4, which are being held for debate, separate voter because of conflict of interest. Councillor Stevenson will move adoption of all those recommendations on consent. Any debate? All those in favor of the consent agenda? And any opposed? And that carries unanimously. So we have just adopted the following reports, communication report one is a revision to the 2015 council meetings schedule. Policy report two is CD1 rezoning 4162-4188 Camby Street. Policy report three is CD1 rezoning 2312-2328 Galt Street. Policy report five is a CD1 text amendment for 1768 Cook Street. Policy report six is a CD1 text amendment for 3837 Point Grey Road. And policy report seven is a CD1 text amendment for 1601 Main Street. Policy report eight is a report back on the arts event license pilot program. And the other two reports, naming of street extensions, Carolina Street and East First Avenue. And the last but not least is naming of street extension and new public streets, Switchman Street and Pullman Porter Street. So those have all uh, been approved on consent. And we are uh, on to our report reference and this morning we have a presentation on Homelessness Action Week 2015 from Abby Bond who's our Director of Housing Policy and Projects. Welcome Ms. Bond. Thank you, Mayor. 
Council. Just for your information, we've handed out a calendar of events coming up for Homelessness Action Week, which you can take away with you and put on your office wall so that you know you don't miss any of the exciting events coming up. Can I get the slides up, please? So thank you for the opportunity to provide you with an overview about what's going to happen during Homelessness Action Week. Um, this initiative is really going to help fulfill Council's priority um, around ending homelessness. And today I'm going to provide you with a brief background on the week, um, its goals and how we're going to reach them this year, what happened last year in 2014, and talk to you about some of the Homeless Connect events and also give you a sneak peek of other events and finally, let you know about the proclamation that's happening in two weeks. I'm just going to, maybe I should pause while I get the slides up. We have some technical difficulties with the uh, audiovisual system. Any success there? Okay, yeah, Council, you can see the presentation okay. if you switch it onto your uh, desk display. It's like the um, projector display is not going to cooperate with us. So, should we hold up here? Just take another minute to see if we can get this working. Ms. Bond, is there anything you want to talk about without the presentation? Sure, we can, I can just, uh, maybe I'll just carry on and, and then you can have a look at the presentation great. Um, after. So, um, Homelessness Action Week, as you know, coincides with World Homelessness Day, which takes place this year on October the 10th. And this is really part of global action around the world, highlighting the tragedy that we see around homelessness. And actions take place across the world, from the US to Zambia. And their focus is around educating people about homelessness issues, celebrating and supporting local good works, and also highlighting local issues. Um, the Homelessness Hub, which is Canada's primary source of information on homelessness, suggests taking action across the year, not just around um, World Homelessness Day, and they identify ways that individuals and communities can get involved, volunteering, donating, advocating, learning, and sharing. So Homelessness Action Week is our local and annual event, which brings public awareness and understanding to the local issues of homelessness in our city and in our region. And this year is the 10th anniversary of taking action during this week in the metro area. So alongside all the work that the city does, we feel it's important to continue to support communities to take action themselves. The interest and creativity over the years has really grown. Originally, it was coordinated by the Metro Vancouver Homelessness Secretariat, but unfortunately, a couple of years ago, the um, federal funding for support for this initiative was withdrawn. However, we've continued to work with homelessness tables around the region to support this event in communities across our region. One of the ways that Vancouver has done this is to support the creation of posters that go in the transit, in transit kind of in bus shelters across the region. We work with the tables to create an annual theme. And as you will eventually be able to see the poster, um, this year's theme is around the invisibility of homelessness with the tagline, Can You See Me? So this is a poster that you'll see across the region in bus shelters highlighting um, and raising awareness about this issue. So it's an opportunity for citizens to get involved in local events and activities. As I said, it's about education, advocacy, and a lot of social media activity to raise hope and raise awareness. So this year, there are four key goals. 
Um, the first is to provide direct services to the homeless. The second is to raise awareness and increase understanding about the causes and actions that, be, that can be taken to address it. Thirdly, to support neighborhood organizations in our city. And finally, that all of these activities support the broad city mandate to create a healthy city, healthy city building health, safe, and inclusive communities. So this year, using these goals as a guide, in July, you approved $43,000 in grants to 18 nonprofit organizations who are going to carry out events and activities related um, to these goals. And an additional 9,000 was approved for the Homeless Connect events that will take place at Evelyn Cellar, Carnegie Alley Health Fair, and The Gathering Place. So looking back, last year what was achieved. Now it's in its 10th year, we have real momentum and capacity with organizations to deliver a variety of events. A significant increase, as I mentioned, in community awareness, and it's quite amazing to see some of the results. So last year, um, around an estimated 4,500 homeless and at-risk at risk vulnerable individuals were directly impacted by events that happened in the city. There were around 4,000 meals that were served, 2,000 care kits, including basic hygiene supplies, socks, winter clothing, and nutritious snacks, and information and education on the causes and solutions to homelessness were given to around 2,000 people. And we connected 160, brought together 160 organizations to deliver services and provide connections. So there's very real and practical support to those most in need in the city. So what are we going to do this year? Um, we're going to continue to build on the success, and I'd like to highlight a few of the activities that you're going to see on your calendar. So the city itself is hosting three events at our facilities, the Carnegie Library, the Evelyn Cellar, and the Gathering Place. And we're going to have support for additional Connect events hosted by community partners. So these events are real the bedrock of the um, activity. Um, they provide a wide range of beneficial services, physical and mental health services, housing support, income assistance, harm reduction, access to dentists, haircuts, foot care, addiction support, advocacy, a huge range of activities. And they're a really important way of engaging communities, promoting volunteerism and increasing awareness. And it's important to note that these events are now not just focused on the one week that is Homelessness Action Week, but happen throughout the year um, so that we meet, try to meet better the needs, ongoing needs of homeless people. A little bit of a sneak peek about what's coming up. This year, we've got a AAA Transit, a public forum on homeless ac access to public transit. We've got the Hello Neighbor Project, which is a community-led tour of the downtown east side, very popular. It's the second annual SRO tenant convention, providing workshops and information to those who are homeless and at risk living in SROs. There's also a community engaged theater event taking place at the Interurban Gallery. And this year, a real focus on engagement with youth. So we've got the Youth Advisory Committee at Frog Hollow Neighborhood House, who are hosting a hunger banquet and community dialogue. Of note is that this project is at Frog Hollow have partnered with another grant recipient, the Aboriginal Mother Centre Society, and will be creating care packages for young mums and babies who are at risk of homelessness. Um, this project really hi highlights the importance this year we place on educating youth about homelessness. Two other projects um, that are also engaged on this theme are Mount Pleasant Neighbourhood House and Renfrew Collingwood Senior Society. And finally, an event I want to highlight very timely considering the current scale of migration of people around the world as a result of conflict. The Inland Refugee Society and UBC have organized a forum on housing and homelessness among refugee claimants. So finally, on October the 13th, Mayor Robertson will present the Homelessness Action Week proclamation to community partners. And this year, the theme will be on youth homelessness. So organizations that shelter, house, and support homeless and vulnerable youth will be invited here for the proclamation. So we invite you to join us. And finally, um, to find out more about what's happening in Vancouver and the region, when eventually the PowerPoint is working, there's a link on there that will take you to the website with uh, all of the events, and we encourage you to visit the website. This is about supporting organizations to take action during this week, and it's just part of our ongoing efforts to end homelessness. Our team here at the city who work on homelessness are pressing ahead with more actions on this issue. 
with continued pressure on the rental vacancy rate in Vancouver and appropriate health care often not getting to those in need, we expect that there will be sustained pressure on our city's most vulnerable. So we've begun discussions with BC Housing about opening winter shelters again this year, looking for locations and opportunities. We are looking for interim housing options like the Quality Inn and the medicine Rooms. Working with partners on the Mayor's Task Force on Mental Health and Addictions is providing real insights and avenues for change in our mental health and addiction system. Work includes collective impact project, a better understanding of benefits of peer support from those with lived experience, looking at the challenges faced by women and opportunities around real-time data sharing. The, partnership being delivered at that, the partnerships being delivered, delivered at that table are vital in changing a large health and support system to better serve those in need. And we continue our work to bring forward projects that include social and supportive housing in Vancouver and embed the requirement to create affordable housing and community plans and other large-scale planning work. And finally, to continue to press for provincial and federal support into local housing projects to enable more supply and, more importantly, make it more affordable. And just a little teaser for you, for, from our recent engagement work on talk housing, um, we've found a lot of information from the public which we'll be bringing back to you at some point with some very interesting results. So thank you, and I hope to see you all at, in October the 13th as part of the proclamation. And apologies for the presentation. It's worth a look. The photos are good. So. Thank, you. thank you very much, Ms. Bond. And um, I understand we will have uh, the presentation circulated by email, but uh, Madam Clerk is advising me that we are going to need to take a couple minute recess to reset the system so we make sure all of our, uh, our audiovisual systems are working properly for the balance of the meeting. And uh, Deputy City Manager, did you have, want to weigh in on that front? Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Just uh, for folks viewing from home, uh, it will be loaded online as well. So people, uh, I think it is already loaded online, so people can see it if they're interested. It to is see online. The PowerPoint. Thank you. Acting City Manager. And welcome to the new job. First Council meeting. Uh, thank you for stepping up. We. Um, we're going to take a couple minute recess now to reset the system, so we'll be back online in just a few minutes. Stand by.
Okay, welcome back. We will uh, call the meeting back to order. We've got our system working in now. So uh, the, the presentation on homelessness, homeless action week is right there and uh, available on the screens. And we are going to go to questions uh, for, where did Ms. Bond go? Is she still? Here she comes. So we've got questions uh, on Homelessness Action Week and all the events that are in front of us. Uh, and I'll start with a big thank you to the whole team for organizing. Every year it feels like we do a little bit more for Homelessness Action Week over the years. And this year it feels like we've taken a big jump in terms of uh, the number of activities and partners. It's great to see more act action on this front. And thanks a lot for all the great work. We'll look forward to uh, being at events, and Councillor Jang, you will probably be at the most events on this front. You have <laughs> thank the floor. You. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, and uh, once again, thanks uh, to uh, Ms. Bond and staff for all their hard work on this. A uh, couple quick questions. What is the SRO Tenant Convention? Um, yeah, that's something that's happened. This is the second one, and this is an opportunity to bring tenants together um, and to give them information about their rights and responsibilities of being a tenant and to find out um, the situation that's happening in many of the hotels. It's an opportunity for us to find out information. Um, yeah, it's a really well-attended event, and we wanted to support it again this year. Great. So who's, are you presenting information? Our, is the city presenting information? Yeah, the city will be in attendance, yeah, definitely. And right. we might bring people from our integrated enforcement works and from also from our housing group as well. Um, as you noted, that uh, the, the range of activities has grown over the years, and I'm glad to see a lot of youth involved. Uh, my daughter's at Frog Hollow, or was. She's too old now, but uh, for that youth program. Um, but what we're seeing, certainly I'm seeing this, is that many of the events are... are aimed at the general public, for example, to build, you know, which is great. But also now we're starting to see a new awareness amongst healthcare providers and, and folks like that, more policymakers. Do we have any events aimed at those, that particular group? Or is that all year round? Um, that's part of the work that we do all year round. Um, but there are some events which are forums, you know, qu encouraging question and answer sessions. And you do see, you know, interested um, agencies attending those to take part in those forums and Q&As. We often see a lot of interest, actually, from agencies around things like the walking tour that you see in the mm -hmm. downtown east side. Um, those are often popular with um, representatives of agencies as well as the general public. Okay. Well, yeah, the Mayor's Task Force on Mental Health and yeah. Addictions was a, a great example where folks got the latest, for example, on mortality rates and, and things like that, shared information folks were about. Yeah. And of course, it was the double uh, IHO, was it now International uh, Leaders of Mental yeah. Health conference right. here as well. And I understand they went on a lot of tours and, uh, and uh, I think they presented to a lot of folks around the city as well, did, did, did they not? Yeah, it was a great international conference on mental health uh, last week, and they came to the Mayor's Task Force meeting. They met with city staff, and they did a number of workshops and a number of tours, and the city staff were very involved. It was a really interesting group of people and a really great event. Okay. Uh, you mentioned shelters, mm. and uh, how are we doing on that front? I know that uh, the chill in the air, and yeah. uh, so I know that you, you mentioned very briefly we were in discussions with BC Housing on that. Uh, how's it looking this year? So we've just started our discussions. We've started our planning work earlier in the summer, looking for um, sites, locations, opportunities, and we've got a number of things in the works, um, which will be moving forward if we're able to get um, support for funding for those from BC Housing. So you're right, this is the time of year when we accelerate the planning for that, because we like to get those open um, in November, if possible, when the weather really starts to get bad. Has BC Housing indicated numbers that they're willing to fund or what the funding levels might be this year? It's very early in the discussion, so no, okay. not yet. So I'll keep my mouth shut until you need me. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Okay. Thanks, Councillor Jang. Councillor Ball. Yes, thank you very much, and thank you for the report. Um, I just had a few questions. One is, you did mention some of the uh, things that were, I think you called them the deliverables. Uh, for instance, you said 4,000 meals and 2,000 care kits, and I'm sorry, I didn't get the, there was another one yeah. that yeah. I didn't get there. Um, are those short-term events, or were we, or were the meals feeding different people, or the same people, or I'm trying to get a, an idea of, of how 
this multitude of events actually produces results in terms of improving homelessness, the situation of the homeless in Vancouver. So do you mind talking a yeah. little bit about that? Sure. That was um, a slide that I used to show a kind of a synopsis of everything that happened last year in Vancouver. And so um, that was just to give you an idea of the kind of the reach and the impact that these events ha have. I mean, it might be that some individuals go to more than one event. Um, but having said that, that's a lot of individuals. So that's all of the connect events that we had last year, all of the community events. Um, that's a large number of both homeless people and at-risk people and a large number of meals to be served. Now, all of them were served during Homelessness Action Week. They were linked to all of the events that happened. Some of them were very community meals. Some of them happened at connect events. So it was really just a synopsis of everything that happened across the city. So feeding people is great for a week. I think that's absolutely fabulous, no matter how many times somebody comes to get fed if they're in that situation. So what do we do to sort of take that generosity of that week and move it forward uh, in terms of nutrition? How does that work? Well, we hope very much that this kind of seed funding, this small-scale community funding, inspires communities to do something, to maybe for the first time, and that that event or that activity goes well and it encourages them to do more in their community. Um, clearly, there's work separately around the policy side in terms of nutrition um, around shelters and for the street. There are a lot of meals being delivered, um, free meals provided in the downtown east side. Um, ultimately, um, you know, we would want to see those real food poverty in the city as some of, in some of the most vulnerable people and really um, I think as council has indicated before, one of the best ways to deal with that is to look at the shelter rate and look at where people are getting their money from, you know, provincial or federal government sources. Um, so there's the community action, um, there's policy work around nutrition um, and support for providers delivering meals through shelters, and then there's also the advocacy work around giving people enough money to properly live on um, so that they can buy and create their own food. Thank you. And I'm sorry if I've forgotten, did we receive a list of who received those grants? Um, yes, we actually brought that to Council in July. I can provide you with the dates and the report, but yeah, at the, in the appendix of that report is a full list of everybody that you approved. The majority of events, like I said, we put on the calendar for you um, to encourage you to attend. That's, that's wonderful. And the other question that I had was, uh, some of the events, it's very clear who is actually sponsoring them, like the uh, Carnegie Alley uh, Health Fair, the Carnegie Library. So I presume that's who's sponsoring that event. But as Councillor Jang was asking, um, who, who is sponsoring the Tenant Convention? Who is sponsoring some of the ones that aren't listed here in terms of an organization? Just so we know who's actually doing this work. Sure. There's usually a lead organization. Sometimes it's a collaboration or a group of partners. If there are particular ones you're interested in, then maybe I can find the information. So we would the be able... The is all on the website. It's example. on the website. Yeah. Excellent. Well, that's very helpful. Well, thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ball. Councillor Meggs. Thanks, uh, Mr. Mayor. Just a couple of questions. One following on Councillor Jangs. He and I are both on the Metro Housing Committee where we hear about some of the issues that are emerging. and. That committee's been working to try to maintain the count across the region and so on. So further to the discussion of shelters, I mean, there was a tragic story in the paper this morning about a woman who died after uh, getting caught in a clothing bin where she was presumably trying to get some warmer clothes. That was in Pitt Meadows, and that's the conflict in Abbotsford, and we've seen the problems in Maple Ridge, and I understand it's more, more visible also in a problematic in Surrey. Is there some uh, regional approach to uh, the province in terms of shelters in that regard, and would that impact our program here? Do you have any idea on that front? Um, like I said, we've just begun very early stages of the discussion. Um, it, if uh, the province decided to fund shelters and activity this winter, it wouldn't be the first time that they've taken action across the region. Um, I'd, you know, I'd like to think we still have significant issues here. We still like a focus in Vancouver, but clearly it helps everybody if there is action taken across at a regional level um, to house and shelter people in their own communities. It seems uh, that some of the other communities are being caught a bit off guard and with less capacity to propose shelters and that kind of thing. Is, have you been observing that? Because I, I have two concerns. One is that they may not be able to, they may not have our experience uh, difficult as it's been in this front. And secondly, uh, the province may try to spread available funding over many more 
uh, requests? Yeah, obviously, with um, I imagine funds being limited, that may well be a challenge. But um, the city, our staff are always available. We do try and support municipalities on a practical level where they're looking to take action. I'm happy to do that at any time um, with you know cities across the region to try and share what we've learned about opening shelters. Um, there are lots of good shelter providers now that we've worked with in Vancouver um, who I know will, could bring their expertise elsewhere in the region as well. Next on a different topic, I was glad to see that uh, we're involved in this AAA Transit Forum on Homeless Access to Public Transit. Yeah. Is that something that um, you know our engineering department could provide some expertise to these guys? I've worked with this group a bit. They're trying to work with Translink in terms of the Compass Card. There's a lot of service providers who have real concerns about a switch over to the Compass Card and what the cost will be and how it'll be used for single trip fares. Has, has the city been doing any work, say, on the transportation side on this front? Because it could be very significant for, uh, for people in this situation if they could have better access to transit. Sure, we can definitely follow up on that and uh, make sure that there are city staff at the event um, and look to see if there's any way we can support actions coming out of that. Yeah, I think that there's some difficult design issues, but there's experts, as you see, they are coming from Calgary and Seattle. So obviously, we're never the first to have tackled these problems. But TransLink has been trying to respond, I think, as best it can, but it's taken longer than people hoped to uh, sort it out. Thanks very much. Okay. Thanks, Councillor Meggs. Councillor Louie. touched on the concept of coordination and uh, at the regional level and how we as a city share uh, within the region and then uh, also about uh, you, you spoke a little bit about the provincial government and how we need to work more closely but one thing that hasn't been I think stated enough is of course there's a federal election uh, um, within a few days of, uh, of uh, now and we need to make sure that uh, that is highlighted that uh, I know the mayor was just recently in Toronto uh, highlighting the uh, the need for more housing affordability across our nation that uh, in fact this Thursday we're hosting co-hosting with SFU on housing and transit and uh, we're, we're working together to, to make that happen but maybe a, a question to you what other opportunities are there uh, for the city are, are you aware of any activities that we're undertaking in order to highlight this issue I like the issue around homelessness particularly homelessness or, and, and, and the housing yeah. continuum actually. Yeah. Um, so, like I said, we continue to work um, through community planning events. So, obviously, I believe Grandview Woodlands um, will be coming back to council. Um, for, there will be new housing policies in, in there for your consideration. Um, that's part of our ongoing work. There's the regional affordable housing strategy that will be coming forward for municipal review across the region, um, I believe, in early 2016. These are you know, excellent opportunities to make sure that housing... Um, action is taken on housing in the region and locally. So those are two. Well, there's a number of, of other organizations that are, of course, involved with housing. The, mm -hmm. the uh, co-op uh, group has, has a national campaign. They're highlighting the need for uh, renewal of uh, CMHC funding uh, across our nation, which is expiring. Maybe just an update on, um, the, are you, in terms of the, provincial, the federal parties, where are, they, where are they at? What sort of commitments? Can you tell us that? I think it varies um, um, across the platforms. Um, clearly, there is interest um, from a variety of players to see the, particularly the subsidies be maintained across the city, sorry, across the country, so the subsidies that um, may otherwise be expiring. Um, there's an opportunity there, and a number of parties have spoken to that. Um, clearly, maybe, there's a maybe, lot of interest. Maybe explain the significance yeah. if these, fund, these funding agreements are not renewed yeah by whichever federal party uh, comes to power, what its impact to the city of Vancouver is? So the, um, when social housing, or the last kind of amount of social housing was created in the 60s, 70s and 80s, many of them were created using CMHC mortgages, which had a subsidy attached to them to make sure that those um, units were affordable to median income and moderate and low income people in Vancouver. As those mortgages expire, the subsidies with them also expire. And so there's a real threat to affordability in this city and across the country that combined with aging buildings, the need to reinvest in those buildings, we will see a worsening situation in terms of affordability. It also creates some opportunities um, for co-op federation and non-profit housing organizations, but there is a risk without that underpinning at a national level, at a federal level, that we will see a loss of affordability. Okay. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thanks, Councillor Louie. And that's all of Councillor's questions. I'll just ask uh, a quick question about the shelter strategy. Councillor Jang had, had uh, inquired about it more. Uh, consultation in communities and getting identifying sites for winter shelters, uh, obviously something we've been doing every year for a number of years now and um, partnering with BC Housing and uh, providers to operate the shelters. Um, what's your sense of it now in terms of uh, locations and uh, capacity and, and support that we can count on from BC Housing? Anything clear there? Um, like I said, the discussions have just begun. Um, the earlier that we can identify the locations, the sooner we can start planning the community dialogue sessions and the engagement with community. Um, so we push hard for kind of an early, um, early information from them, from them about what they're prepared to fund in Vancouver. But I don't have any uh, real update at this point, except to say those conversations have begun, and we have started as a city looking at possible locations. Okay, thanks for uh, that update, and thanks for all the good work done. Some uh, busy weeks ahead, getting uh, getting ready with the shelter strategy and. Homelessness Action Week, so uh, thanks for all the efforts. We will stay tuned on all that. And that is all for our uh, presentation on Homelessness Action Week. And we're going to move along to uh, our piece of unfinished business. Now, following the public hearing, which was held on July the 21st, 28th, and September the 15th regarding the First Shaughnessy Heritage designation area rezoning, Council completed the public comment portion of the hearing and referred decision on the application to this meeting of Council as unfinished business. So I will uh, check with uh, those, uh, those members of Council who were absent from some or all of the public hearing, uh, so we're clear on who's participating. Councillor Jang, you were absent from all of the public hearing. Uh, you therefore will not be participating. Okay, in the discussion or the vote on this matter. Other council members who missed a portion of the hearing may vote on the application if they confirm that they've uh, reviewed the proceedings, the tapes uh, for the portion of the hearing that they missed. And uh, first of all, Councillor Ball, you were absent July the 28th. Have you reviewed the proceedings for that portion of the hearing? Yes, I have reviewed the tapes and I will be voting. Thank okay, thank you. And Councillor Louie, you were absent on September the 15th one of the meetings. Have you reviewed the proceedings for that portion of the hearing? You have, so you will be participating. And Councillor Reimer, you were absent for approximately one and a half hours on September the 15th. Uh, have, you reviewed, have you reviewed that portion of the meeting? Okay, you will be participating. Uh, I will not be participating. I was not at uh, July 21st or the 28th. Uh, and a portion of September the 15th uh, I chaired, but uh, I will not be participating uh, in this uh, discussion or vote, but I will uh, be the chair uh, to keep things uh, moving along here. So we, first of all, will I'll ask uh, Jane Pickering from our planning department to give us the last responses to the questions that were posed at the end of the public co comments. When we closed public comments and council sent in their last questions to Ms. Pickering. So we'll have uh, responses to that, and then we'll need to go right to uh, debate and decision on this matter. Ms. Pickering, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, at the conclusion of the public hearing on the 15th, we had nine questions forwarded to us from Council, and I'm going to go through those nine questions and provide the answers for you today, and I will do my best to be as succinct as possible. Uh, the first question, um, could the city provide relief on property taxes for renovations of heritage homes or during the renovation period? The very simple answer to that is yes, Council does have the authority to, pr to approve property tax exemptions for up to 10 years for protected heritage property according to Section 396A of the Vancouver Charter. To date, the heritage property tax exemption tool has only been used in the downtown east side as part of the Special Heritage Building Rehabilitation Program. We will be examining the applicability of this incentive to other parts of the city later this fall as part of the Heritage Action Plan and the consideration of a property tax exemption program for renovations um, of heritage homes will be looked at as part of that review. So we will be back to report out on a more fulsome, um, on a more fulsome way. Question number two, could Council establish a not-too-onerous process in the short term 
um, example before the bylaw is enacted for homeowners to make the case that their pre-1940 home is not historically or architecturally meritorious and have it excluded from the HCA designation. Uh, today, Council is uh, looking at a recommendation that adopts the recommendations and enacts the bylaws immediately before the temporary protection period ends on October 6. So that's our recommendation that's before you today. If adopted, the proposed Heritage Procedure Bylaw and First Shaughnessy de Design Guidelines will provide direction for how removal of a property will be considered. At any time, property owners will be able to request a review of the heritage character and heritage value of their home through a development inquiry process. If there is support to remove the property from the list, a recommendation to amend the, OC, the HCA ODP would come to Council and it would be Council's determination on whether it's removed or not removed. Question number three, is population densification of Shaughnessy an intent of the proposed changes to zoning and incentives to retain a home? And how much increased density would result through infill and conversion suites? So firstly, um, before I answer the question, I'd just like to remind Council that infill buildings and multiple conversion dwelling units are already permitted uses in First Shaughnessy. And the proposals before you include updates, but they are not a big departure from the current situation. So in response to the actual question about population densification, the answer, simple answer is no. Um, increasing the population of First Shaughnessy was not the intent of the recommendations. It was more about supporting a variety of dwelling units and dwelling types in the area. Including the range of dwelling unit types um, will bring additional opportunities to the area that are available in, in the city's other single family areas and supports Council's goal to create housing opportunities and diversity. I would also like to point out that not all properties will be able to pursue additional units in First Shaughnessy. Even if there is a considerable take up on the properties that will be allowed to do this, uh, First Shaughnessy will be maintaining its single family character and has a density much lower than other single family parts of the city. So I cannot provide you actual population density estimates because there are a lot of variables at play on these proposals, but I can tell Council that half of the properties in First Shaughnessy will be able to pursue infill or coach house use, and those are the sites that will be listed in the HCA. In terms of totality, it's 23% of all the sites in First Shaughnessy. Question number four, what is the actual number of, of residential heritage conservation areas in British Columbia? and how many of those residential HCAs offer compensation and how much to homeowners. The Provincial Heritage Branch conducts an annual survey of local governments and reports that in 2014 there were 60 HCAs in British Columbia. They do not collect detailed data on each, on each of those HCAs, so we don't actually know how many are residential. But we did make some calls and did some digging on our own, uh, a little better than the province provides in terms of their data, and we can share the following. The City of Victoria has nine HCAs and five of them are residential. The District of West Vancouver has one and it is residential. The City of Nanaimo has one and it is mixed use and includes part of their downtown, so it would be partly residential. The City of North Vancouver has one, um, which is a residential area, as has the Township of Langley. They have two and both of them have residential components. That's Fort Langley and Murrayville and they both have residential components. Of the five municipalities of those five, two included a schedule of protected heritage property as part of the HCA, similar to what is being proposed today for First Shaughnessy. One included a list of only previously designated uh, buildings and two did not include a list of properties. All the municipalities that we contacted did not provide compensation to property owners when establishing their HCA as it is not a requirement of the Local Government Act. We also looked again at the province of Ontario that I reported back on the last time we were here um, and they, because they do collect a lot more data on their particular areas. They have 120 heritage conservation districts province-wide, 50% of those are purely residential and they cover more than 10,000 properties. In Toronto there are 20 HCA, HCDs, 16 are purely residential with more than 4,500 properties. In Ottawa, the village of Rockcliffe Park has 864 properties. Similar to British Columbia, uh, compensation is not provided to property owners when a heritage conservation area is adopted in Ontario. Question number five, what could be reasons why the proposed density options are not financially viable? 
So the financial analysis that uh, Coriolis Consulting presented uh, to Council shows that the potential impact will vary depending on the characteristics of the individual properties and on the market interest uh, on the properties that use the revenue producing aspects. They concluded that if a pre-1940 property owner pursues those additional uses and the floor area available, there is enough benefit to offset the possible uh, impact of reduced market interest in having to keep the existing house. Some speakers at the public hearing stated that they were not interested in the additional dwelling uses in the proposed new regulations for pre-1940 homes, and that's their choice. But it doesn't mean that the, pro pro the proposals are inherently financially unviable. While a current property owner may not be interested in, in uh, pursuing those uses, a future property owner may, and they will likely find that renovating the property and including those does make it financially viable. Question number six. What are the unique advantages of a heritage conservation area that make it the recommended option over modifying the current ODP? The key advantage of the heritage conservation area is that it makes absolutely clear the heritage conservation objectives of the ODP. We have had some confusion over that in the past. In addition, the following are the advantages. It clearly identifies the properties being conserved through the list. It removes the requirement of a statement of significance and review process as part of development applications, which is quite significant. It incorporates uh, updated design guidelines into the HCA. It creates the ability for the adoption of, of a heritage property standards and maintenance bylaw. Again, very significant. Removes the requirement of heritage designation for individual properties, but maintains the ability to work with the property owners who wish to pursue some of the development opportunities being presented for them. It reduces reliance on time-consuming heritage revitalization agreements to achieve heritage conservation, which can be similar in complexity and time as a rezoning process. That being said, the tool is still available if, if we need to use it. Question number seven, is it feasible for staff to review and report back in six months on whether the incentives for retention are working and or should be modified? We are happy to report back to Council, and, uh, but need, feel that we need some adequate time in order to make sure that the proposals have been uh, properly evaluated. If Council wishes to, in, to initiate a review period, we would recommend that we report back after 15 development projects have been completed under the new regulations. If in the meantime minor issues are identified that could improve the process, then we will certainly bring those forward to Council. Question number eight. One speaker said it took one owner doing renovations nine months to get a permit. What is the average wait time for a major renovation permit in Fershaughnessy, and could that be sped up? In general, major renovation projects in Fershaughnessy take a minimum of six months from the date of application for both the development permit and the building permit to be issued. This includes approximately 14 to 16 weeks for the review and approval of the development permit and six to eight weeks for a building permit. It does not include the time spent in pre-application review, which can vary um, according to the nature of the proposal. Most delays happen when there is a proposal to demolish the pre-1940s homes on the heritage inventory. Currently, those proposals require submission of a statement of significance and review by the heritage, um, Vancouver Heritage Commission, which typically takes an additional six weeks. Also, development permits for major renovations in the area are reviewed by the First Shaughnessy Advisory Design Panel. And if there, are, if there are questions by the panel or the proposal doesn't meet their specific requirements, they may need to return to the panel multiple times. <coughs> Establishing the HCA will shorten the pre-application review as it's clear from the outset whether a building is to be retained or not to be retained. And if someone requests a review of the heritage character and the value, it will be, it will be uh, a quicker time period in order to get an answer because they won't be required to do the statement of significance any longer. And that is significant for homeowners. Council may recall that through the Heritage Action Plan, establishing the HCA will shorten the, the pre-application review time as it... Um, if someone requests a review, they will no longer have to do the statement of significance because it's clear that it's already on the list. Council may recall that through the Heritage Action Plan, uh, we will be looking at ways to improve the permitting times for retention projects throughout the city, and we will be reporting back on that later this year. And question number nine, 
Are there extra costs to comply with maintenance regulations? No additional costs are anticipated through the application of the new regulations beyond regular maintenance expenses that any homeowner would expect. The intent is that the bylaw will be used in cases where buildings are deteriorating to a degree that significant repairs will be needed if action is not taken in the short term. It will not be used to police property owners around basic home maintenance or as uh, was suggested at the public hearing, we tell them what color flowers to plant in their gardens. It will be implemented in a matter similar to the standards of maintenance and untidy premises through a complaint process where the community calls to report properties of concern. As the issue of demolition by neglect is not limited to First Shaughnessy, the Heritage Action Plan again will be examining its applicability elsewhere and will, will be reporting back to Council later this year. And that's the end of the questions, Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Pickering, for uh, the comprehensive answers. Uh, to close out all of the questions related to uh, this uh, public hearing, and we go now to uh, debate and decision on this matter. I've got Councillor Deal first on the queue. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you to staff for all of your hard work on this uh, on this big issue for the city. Um, I stand to move uh, A through H in the Heritage uh, Report before us for First Shaughnessy. Um, this has been a long f public hearing. There's been a lot of anxiety, there's been a lot of information, some of which is accurate, some of which is not. But what is undeniable is that in a very young city, uh, we have a heritage program which struggles to find those pieces of heritage which are much younger than places in Europe might be and identify those as the ones that we protect and we preserve. And there is no question that First Shaughnessy is such a place. 1907 is the date when it was first established as a place where people could escape the West End, which was seen to be a little too bustling for some people. And ever since that time in 1907, people have sought that neighborhood for the large lots, for the, for the mature trees, for the pre peace and tranquility, and the winding roads, and that wonderful atmosphere that you get there uh, in the city of Vancouver. We heard from a lot of homeowners over this last uh, public hearing, and some of them were people who've enjoyed those amenities, who've enjoyed that wonderful leafy, respite from the city for decades and some have moved there recently but they all moved to and live in a neighborhood which is full of history which is full of heritage those beautiful homes which were built so long ago by the founders of this uh, of the modern european version of this city i should say um, and have been maintained as uh, one of the really unique neighborhoods in this in this city the people who live there didn't choose to live in some of our more modern neighborhoods which have large big, big houses and some of them on large lots they didn't choose to live out in the suburbs they chose to live in the heart of the city in a place which is unique and which needs to be preserved. I'm strongly in favor of this. Um, it's in a neighborhood that's been identified as unique to the city for a very long time. It was in 1982 that it got its first uh, official development plan uh, because it was recognized as unique. It was recognized as a jewel in the city. Uh, it got its own uh, housing inventory in 1994. And yet in recent years, we've seen a, a sharp increase in the number of people who are bringing in applications to demolish those old houses and replace them with modern homes. Through this process of speaking with neighbors, every single home has been visited, uh, every single person has been spoken with by our staff. Uh, the heritage experts in the city have been consulted, people in the real estate, the Coriolis Report. Much data has been brought into this, and I feel our staff have come up with a really beautiful balance of offering something to those people who have those homes so that they have an incentive to retain the homes and then automatically by default putting the ones uh, that are over uh, that are old enough onto the register so that they're protected there is an option for people to opt out if they've got a home that's been highly impacted that has been uh, renovated beyond recognition or that's in extremely bad shape those options will be there for those owners but for the rest of the people, we've made it easy for you to continue to enjoy this amazing neighborhood, your home, which has so much value to the city and to yourselves by upgrading it, uh, putting it on the register automatically, and then allowing you that extra bit of density, which already exists in that neighborhood and which our heritage experts support, the coach houses, which are already there, the multi-unit, the secondary suites. We've already seen lots of that in the neighborhood. There's a lot more density than one person or one family per home now. And by allowing that to continue and expand a bit, we're giving that incentive to people um, to balance the fact that we're changing the registration of their home. 
I think that this will be a neighborhood that we look back on decades from now and say, thank goodness we preserved it when we did. Uh, if we'd waited another couple of years, we could have seen uh, another dozen or two dozen homes destroyed, 19 applications in play right now. And instead, what we've did, said is that we recognize the value of this place. We recognize why people moved to this neighborhood in the first place, why they continue to move to this neighborhood, this dense, non-dense, beautiful, uh, um, beautiful treed neighborhood with these large homes on these large lots in a neighborhood that's right in the middle of the city. And you don't find that very often. You won't find that in the future of a new city. We need to keep this one here. It's beautiful. It's been uh, well maintained and well loved. We will continue to work with each homeowner to make sure that they have all the opp opportunities and options before them. And I'm just thrilled to be moving this forward and helping to preserve First Shaughnessy in perpetuity for the people of the city of Vancouver. All right, thank you very much, Councillor Deal. So we have a motion on the floor and we'll go to Councillor Carr. Um, actually, Mr. Mayor, I'm just in the process of writing an amendment, so if I could just get off the list at this point okay. and get back on. Councillor Meggs is next. Uh, I'm surprised by Councillor Carr's uh, decision to step back. I can't imagine how we could improve this, uh, this motion. Uh, Mr. Mayor, but I look forward to seeing a suggestion. Uh, this has been a long debate, a uh, long hearing. I think we did it twice. Um, and, uh, and I think that it's important that we do take steps to protect the character of our, of our city and its history. This is a, a particular case that uh, is steeped in, in the history of the city because it began life as a CPR-driven planned community to give the wealthiest people in the city a chance to escape from the West End, which was getting a, a little bit too close to the uh, bustling downtown core and some of the renters who were creeping in. So uh, a golf course was located nearby, but the basic infrastructure was all designed and built at one crack at that time to serve a particular group of people. So in many respects, it was very forward-looking because it was a different, in my view, a different kind of marketing and it had a continuous uh, design approach from a single developer at a very large scale. And, and it is a very beautiful place. Uh, I want to just reflect, and I don't want to go through all the names, but this proposal has very broad support in Shaughnessy and across the city. We heard a lot from people who are opposed to it. But we heard a lot as well from people who've worked very, very hard in this process and said that this was what they thought would be good for the community and what would be good for uh, heritage protection and acknowledgement in, in the city. I think it will provide direction and a pattern for how we may want to proceed in other neighborhoods, although there wouldn't be a cookie cutter approach because there's only one uh, for Shaughnessy. I think it strikes an appropriate balance, but it won't cast the neighborhood in amber. It won't freeze life in one spot because there are measures there for people who have very significant uh, heritage values in their homes to uh, do certain kinds of densification, put in, uh, in uh, uh, laneway houses or separate coach houses or something of that sort. That's been going on for some time. And as Councillor Deal has pointed out, where people have no heritage value or it's been substantially destroyed by previous thoughtless development, uh, then that will be acknowledged and, and uh, owners can go forward in that regard. I think Councillor Deal makes another good point, which is that anybody who bought in Shaughnessy thinking that the value of the neighbourhood was derived from the possibility of knocking it down and starting over was simply not paying attention. Had we probably had an uninformed real estate agent, the value in the community, and I think that was articulated even by people who are protesting some of the measures here, is in its uh, specific uh, historic design, the, lay the uh, layout of it, the landscaping and all of that kind of thing. And that's exactly what people are looking for. So, I think that uh, the idea of, of compensation is, is objectionable because this is a very, very uh, successful neighbourhood and no one can aspire to live there without already having been very, very successful. So I hope that we don't hear recommendations that we send tax relief to some of the most privileged uh, homeowners in the city who are now getting an extra level of protection. Uh, I think that uh, on the balance of this kind of protection, we need to see as well uh, a practical approach to making sure there's an expansion of housing in other neighborhoods and not a, uh, an attempt to sort of block sensible development in our more recent neighborhoods. A lot of the city dates from after the Second World War, which even in Canadian terms is like yesterday. So a lot of these uh, developments in neighborhoods where we're seeing concern about development on materials has to be taken very respectfully and listened to, but unless we start to see those changes in our city, which we've seen in all the other major cities in Canada, Toronto and Montreal and so on, at a much earlier date in their history. I think we're going to really make it difficult for the rest of the population to find the kind of housing options they need. So I'm happy to support this and uh, I thank all those who took the time to come down and tell us their views about this uh, tricky but important problem. Thanks, Councillor Meggs. And Councillor DiGenova is next. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. First of all, I'd 
I'd just like to uh, mention that I've sent an amendment over to staff to post. And uh, I'll start just by, first of all, I'd like to thank staff. Actually, it's not two times, it's three times that we're back here now. So thank you very much to staff. And as the, one of the liaisons with Councillor Affleck to the First Shaughnessy Advisory Design Panel, I know that this was a lengthy process. There was a lot of consultation done with the community, with the panel. We saw a number of people come out. And I think that there's a balance that needs to be struck here. And Councillor Meggs mentioned that as well. There needs to be practical approaches, uh, conserving heritage, but also making sure that we do recognize that some of the homes on the registry may not be architectural actually meritorious any longer. And in those cases, we do need to take a look at those homes. So I proposed an amendment because some of the people who came to us said, if my house is deemed architecturally meritorious, I will keep it. However, I have brought photos with me to show you how I feel and others feel that it's not. Now, is it up for me to judge that? No. I think that we have staff who are very skilled, uh, and I know that there is a process, and I respect that process. However, what I think we all hear and there was a question asked, and I asked that question myself, is how long is this process going to take? And some people are afraid that this process may be three, four, five years, it may involve community consultation. And so it should. But my amendment here, uh, which I'll read out just the last part, uh, speaks to a timeline of six months for a development inquiry to look into whether or not a home is architecturally meritorious and should remain on the registry. So if it is architecturally meritorious and does have heritage value, it would stay on the registry, but it just helps with that check those checks and balances for those people who may have been caught in the middle, for those people who may have bought not knowing that this policy was coming forward and came forward and pleaded to us. So if their home is deemed that way, they can either choose to live in Shaughnessy in that home or move to another neighborhood where they can rebuild. Uh, and if it's deemed not architecturally meritorious, they can move forward within six months and hopefully have their applications in within the next three months. So the amendment, uh, which is an addition, reads with a maximum timeline of up to six months from the date of the application of a development inquiry for pre-1940s homes currently listed on the Heritage Registry that may no longer be architecturally meritorious or which have not retained the character of a pre-1940s home to be reviewed and released from the registry as appropriate. I want to say that I feel that First Shaughnessy is a very special area and we do need to conserve it, but that being said, we also need to make sure that there's the checks and balances in place for those homes that are no longer architecturally meritorious. And moving to another um, issue of making sure that we are encouraging citizens to maintain their homes. And if they feel that they can't do that or that there's going to be a lengthy process, perhaps uh, people will will not take on uh, the task of trying to restore heritage homes or moving into First Shaughnessy. I think that we should be celebrating heritage in our city, and by doing so, uh, add this, this addition to the motion, which I'd like to say I think I, I really do want to compliment our staff for bringing forward this report. I know that they've spent many hours on it. I know from sitting at the uh, advisory design panel myself that, that certainly had been a lot of work, not only with the panel, but with citizens. There was a lot of back and forth, a lot of changes that got us to this point, and I did see that. So I'd like to say uh, thank you to our staff, thank you to all the speakers who came out. Uh, I, I feel that, that this plan should be supported, but that being said, I think there should be checks and balances. I think that right now it's taking certainly longer than it should uh, for people to uh, perhaps put forward a development application. And I think the word development inquiry might not serve justice to this because an inquiry may just be to take the home off the registry, not to redevelop it, but to renovate it in a way that is not currently allowed under the regulations. So that's the amendment that I'm putting forward and I'm hoping that my colleagues will support it. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor DiGenova. We have an amendment queue and Councillor Deal is first up. Thank you. Uh, I do not support this amendment. The question was asked and answered during the public hearing about how long this process might take, and the staff were saying that uh, they would certainly not dally on them. There's no advantage to the city to taking extra time on these, but nor would they hi um, hybrid them off or, or hive them off and put them ahead of other people with their other applications in. Um, I have full faith that the staff will, will do these uh, applications as quickly as they can and in the order in which they were received along with other applications in the city. We have been working very hard on streamlining and speeding up that process for everybody uh, with a lot of extra 
extra resources and, and effort on that. So I uh, absolutely support the applications to not be included, uh, being considered as rapidly as possible. But to put such a timeline on it is unrealistic and, in fact, might have the perhaps unintended consequence of bumping these ahead of other people with uh, also highly meritorious things coming before um, our staff for consideration. So I do not support this. Thanks, Councillor Deal. Councillor Affleck to the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, yeah, I'll support this. I think this we heard clearly from a major part of the people, pe number of people who came to speak that this was a concern of theirs. But there was no clarity in the uh, motions themselves that uh, there was the providing the understanding of how long this would be, if it would be possible. Well, I understand it's in the report, uh, adding this into the actual uh, motion and the policy, I think it's a good idea to provide clarity and uh, uh, to put aside those concerns that the neighborhood has about the homes that are not potentially fit into the, the criteria. So I'll support this. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Carr, the amendment? Yes, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Is it possible to ask a question of staff on the amendment? Uh, if if that's what you need to Thank you. vote on the need, issue. I do. Thank you very much. Um, so I, I would like to ask we, um, whether or not a six-month timeline on the evaluation of a home as to whether it's meritorious or not it should be, and should be removed from the list is a reasonable timeline. That's a difficult question to answer, Councillor Carr, but I'll do my best to be succinct for you. I don't think uh, necessarily the timeline is unreasonable, but it may not be actually practical. Uh, there is often uh, a, a lot of information that the applicant will bring in, and I don't feel that we can guarantee a six-month time frame. That puts me in a difficult position. Um, I, I, I absolutely believe that the intent of this um, amendment is appropriate. Uh, we heard concerns raised by the citizens during the public hearing. The reassurance was given by staff and also um, in capturing the words of, of our heritage consultant, Mr. Luxton, that there is an ability. The reason why all the homes pre-1940 was put on is was made clear, but also um, the amelioration of that, which is to be able to remove that home from the list. And a timeliness in doing that, I think, w is, is, uh, is very important. Um, given, that I, given the difficulty that I think this poses to staff in terms of whether or not that timeline is accurate, I I'm going to weigh in favor of, of us being more timely and in our review of applications, because I think that is a goal of our city as a whole. So I will support um, this uh, amendment. Okay, Councillor Ball. Yes, thank you very much. Um, so many of the people that came in to see us expressed uh, worries about their timeline in terms of their, their development permit and everything. But this doesn't refer to the development permit. This, just ref this amendment just refers to being released from uh, the actual heritage register. And the uh, consultant said to us there were very few houses that needed to be accommodated in this way, that the majority of the houses were actually meritorious. So I'm wondering why, if there are such a, f a few number of houses, why we couldn't do that in a timely fashion and actually allow those people to be able to choose whether to move forward or not move forward, whatever the situation may be, uh, given that there are so very few. Uh, we're not talking hundreds here. We're talking, I think the consultant said there were under 20. So um, I, I understand Councillor Deal's worry about people getting, in, uh, getting ahead of others or being placed in a queue, but this is not about the development queue. This is simply about uh, when you have a house that isn't appropriate to be on the register and there apparently are very few according to the council. So I will vote for this amendment. Thank you. Thank you. And Councillor Reimer, next. Thanks, Mayor Robertson. Um, well, I, I definitely support the intent of where this is going, but I have to admit I had to read it three times to get a good sense of what possibilities it might um, open up. And I was particularly sort of stuck on this idea that somehow we would review an inquiry, which is by definition not an application based on the date of it, its application. All to say, it's a little tortured in its language. Um, and my concern is that through that language, um, we create a conundrum we can't get ourselves out of. I, I do think in six months, 
is half a year. I, I'm not sure if there was any scientific analysis that went into that number, but I, I'm guessing from the answer from staff, it, it's just, it, it's a fairly arbitrary number. I, I think what I'm hearing is that everybody has a concept that a reasonable timeline is, is what we should seek as a city. I think the best way to establish what that reasonable timeline looks like is after getting the 15, I'm hoping there's an amendment coming forward that allows one to look at those 15 development um, applications and peg what a reasonable timeline looks like. It could be that a reasonable timeline is much shorter than six months. We have no way of knowing that um, without going through that process. So I would support um, the concept once I had enough information to provide a number to that reasonable timeline. I do have some concerns based on the testimony we heard at public hearing as well as some of the information that we're going to have this immediate uh, glut of applications to the process that might skew what a reasonable timeline looks like given the workload. Uh, so I would rather that all play out. We look at the 15 um, applications that go through the process and decide how we establish a reasonable timeline going forward. So I will be voting against the amendment. Thanks, Councillor Reimer. Councillor Louie, the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, for very similar reasons to Councillor uh, Reimer, I also agree with the intent that we need to uh, work as closely as we can with the residents of this area to ensure that we give them the certainty necessary uh, to uh, proceed or not to proceed and how to conduct their, their business um, given the, the overlay of this, uh, this initiative. Uh, but at the same time, the, the language within the amendment uh, uh, doesn't make sense. You know, what, an application is an application, an inquiry is something uh, completely different. So the language uh, causes confusion. But what, what I'm also hearing from some of the in, in the debate is that this is not about an application for heritage preservation, but rather it's a process. I think the intent, if I read it correctly, is that the intent is that uh, we give an avenue for people to pull out and create a completely separate stream, and that's uh, something that I think uh, is the the uh, objective of some of the, uh, the councillors. So. Um, that, I think, is a, a good piece of work to be done. Uh, but like Councillor Reimer has stated, we have experienced, this, uh, experienced a number of gluts of applications when new policy is set. And to, uh, before we go about uh, setting a framework on timelines of when we would clear this glut, whether it's, you know, you know, whether it be an issue with trees or heritage preservation or uh, our new building bylaws, we have seen uh, applications come to the door at a very accelerated pace. So I would prefer, as Councillor Reimers has stated, for us to gain some experience, see what it is that uh, transpires. Um, certainly, I think what I'm hearing is that people want to support heritage preservation, but to do it in a reasonable fashion. But I don't believe that uh, uh, we should set ourselves up for failure uh, set ourselves up in a situation where we're, we're looking for expediency of process and we ultimately may lose uh, some uh, heritage homes because we're forcing uh, through a, a review process that may not be as full and complete and uh, result in losing some heritage uh, uh, structures in our city as a result of trying to meet a six-month timeline. I'd rather do it properly. I'd rather uh, do the job fully uh, rather than uh, going to this artificial timeline. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thanks, Councillor Louis. Councillor Meggs? Yeah, just briefly, Mr. Mayor. I think Councillor Louis said it well, but the question of whether or not it has merit is precisely the point. And, uh, you know, we mostly had this concern for people who are absolutely convinced their place has no merit. If that's the case, then I think staff would be able to make quite a timely decision. But what we've learned is that through back and forth discussion and pointing out some of the advantages that are in this new uh, bylaw, people may draw a different conclusion than, than we heard some of them saying at the microphone, which was that. They were certain it had no value and they were certain they needed to tear it down and they were certainly needed to get that done as quickly as possible. So to me, this looks like a fast track to demolition and that's not what the uh, spirit of this bylaw is all about. Thanks, Councillor Meggs. So we'll go to a, the voting queue on Councillor DiGenova's amendment. Ask uh, everyone who is eligible to vote on this. And we have all the votes in, uh, nine total votes. Uh, the 
four in favor and five in opposition. So the amendment does not carry uh, Louis Stevenson deal, Reimer and Megs in opposition. And that uh, means the amendment does not pass. And we go back to uh, the main queue. And uh, Councillor Di Genova, did you want to speak to the main motion here? Yes, Mr. Mayor, I'm quite disappointed that the amendment didn't pass. And although Councillor Meg seems to pin this amendment as a fast track to demolition, I, I disagree. I think that what we're trying to do here is follow the. We're not, uh, yeah. I, I know, I'm going to back to motion. the main motion. But what I'm saying is, I would hope that we would be pushing ourselves as a city and as a council to deal with things in a timely manner. And although I have the utmost faith in our staff, I see the concerns of all of the people who have come to speak to us, uh, especially Mr. Hill, who brought pictures of his home. And maybe architecturally meritorious is up for interpretation here, but uh, certainly his home did not reflect most of the homes in First Shaughnessy that I would look at and think of uh, the heritage gems of our city. So uh, this. Certainly, uh, it does concern me that a number of people will be bogged down in the inquiry process. And actually, I'm, I'm not quite sure if maybe some of my counselors know that you actually have to go and apply. So you have to make an application for an inquiry. So uh, I had a great tour of the Development Application Center, if anybody else would like to go down there. It's excellent. Uh, also, this is not, you know, I, I would like to thank the First Shaughnessy Advisory Design Panel. I know they put several hours into this, also working with our staff and uh, all of the people who came out to speak to us. Uh, really, this, this in a sense, I, I think, has people in Vancouver talking about heritage conservation and if there will be other areas that also these similar uh, policy will be applied to in the future. So it's something to certainly look at as we try and retain the heritage value in our city. So overall, I will be supporting this. However, you know, it saddens me You're that we're not kind of pushing ourselves as a city to look at how we can uh, deal with these people who are caught in limbo. This certainly is not a fast track to demolition. Um, that is your time, Councillor G. Genova. Thank you. And Councillor Ball is next to the main motion. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Deal spoke very movingly of how important heritage is to our city. And as we've been working on this, this proposal in the city, as uh, our staff have been preparing us for today, I've had a chance to look at a number of uh, beautiful heritage uh, areas throughout North America, and all of them. Uh, actually decayed. They decayed because people weren't able to support the large size houses and so they decayed, they became rooming houses and then they were abandoned and then finally uh, it usually was one individual who decided to start repairing those houses and, and bring them back to life and bring the neighborhood back to life and we're lucky. That hasn't happened in Shaughnessy by and large. And so I think it's, it's great that, that that hasn't happened here and that our, our staff have been able to spend a great deal of time looking at all of the options that have been brought to them to try to encourage people to be able to keep their homes and uh, to be able to maintain, as Councillor Deal said, the heritage that is important to everyone in the city. Um, we have heard time and time again that people trying to renovate their houses feel that they are spending too long uh, at uh, waiting for permits so that they can actually move forward, not in tearing down their houses, but in repairing them and bringing them back to life. So I know that that has been brought up by every councillor at some point, but I think that would make a huge difference to people's encouragement in, in um, actually renovating their homes rather than uh, destroying them. I. Um, I've read carefully all of this, I've listened to everyone, I've gone through everything, and I repeatedly asked people who came to, to speak to us, what else would you suggest, what else would, uh, what, what else would you think we could do? And a number, a few of them um, actually made a few suggestions regarding tax, so it was good to hear uh, the response from our staff today that that indeed could be possible. So. Uh, I certainly appreciate all the work that's been done by everyone and uh, I'm happy to vote for this today. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Ball. Councillor Carr. Yes, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Uh, my thanks, too, to staff for the immense amount of work 
involved in this bringing this uh, proposal forward and to everyone who came uh, to speak to us. It was passionate debate on both sides of the issue. I have an amendment to put forward and I have forwarded it. I also, um, as I was editing it, uh, left one word in which I've also forwarded to you. To is that council requests staff to report back after the issuance of development and building permits of 15 applications um, so under this plan on the impact and effectiveness of the establishment of the heritage conservation area um, and possible recommendations to further incentivize heritage retention such as property tax relief or renovation of a heritage home. Uh, thank you um, for answering those questions um, that I posed at the end of the last section. And I'm very happy to hear that we are looking at things like um, possible tax relief for heritage uh, home re renovation and retention as part of our heritage action plan. And hopefully by the end of the year and early next year, um, 15 applications won't happen before that period, I don't think, but <laughs> that it'll time it'll time well. Um, my reason for putting forward the amendment is that um, we had a number of people speak to us and many of them saying, you know, there are a lot of changes in this and we're a little worried about how these changes are going to work out. Um, and that included architects and people who have been involved in heritage protection within this city. And they recommended that we do something more short term and then review it. Um, so I think the review is an appropriate thing to do given the concerns in the architectural community itself uh, for us to take a look at whether these um, incentives to retain heritage homes um, are working. I'm particularly concerned around, for example, whether or not we're you know, we should be only exempting basements from heritage retention projects as opposed to new builds, but I think our staff can answer those kinds of questions in that period of time. So I'm um, really, at this point, not speaking to the main motion, but to my amendment and, um, and hoping that, uh, that my amendment does receive the support of council. Okay, thank you, Councillor Carr. Uh, we have an am amendment queue I had going there. Does anyone wish to speak to the amendment? Councillor Deal. Thank you very much. I'd love to see this amendment divided. There are two separate pieces of it. Um, so I move to sever uh, after heritage conservation area into a second part, A and, a and B, and the B being the um, possible recommendations. I would support the first portion of this with no problem. In fact, I intended to put that in the original motion, but, but neglected to do so. So absolutely support that. On the second piece of this, uh, I have concerns in that the staff are in, uh, undergoing ongoing monitoring and ongoing looking for improvements and ways to, to, to change this. We're going to be doing the character home piece, which is massive, coming up soon. So to direct that this be the only thing that they focus on, to me, is, is incorrect and inappropriate. Uh, obviously, we'll be using, looking at all the incentives, seeing how they work, and seeing if the program is successful. So I would not support Jay. I believe that it's far too prescriptive on a body of work that the staff are already undertaking um, as they, they hear more from the homers, as they move forward with this program and continue to look at the rest of the Heritage Conservation Program, I feel that uh, adding extra focus on this piece above and beyond what they'll already be doing is, isn't appropriate and that we should allow them to do their work without that kind of fettering. Thanks, Councillor Deal. So we have, uh, we've just basically separated those two, severed those two items in the amendment. Uh, Madam Clerk, we don't need a additional motion or anything to that effect, we're okay. It's consistent with the content of Councillor Carr's amendment, okay. So to the uh, the slightly adjusted amendment, uh, Councillor Di Genova. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I will be supporting this amendment. I think that the spirit of what Councillor Carr's amendment is trying to achieve is to make sure that we do look at those certain homes that may be on the registry that are in limbo right now. And I think that's important to do. I don't think, I also, uh, for now, what is listed as J and is another part of the amendment, what I've heard here, which concerns me, is that only rich people live in Shaughnessy. I've heard it mentioned by a few councillors. And that certainly just isn't the case. That's not what we heard from many of the speakers here. And I think Councillor Carr, in looking at different opportunities for retaining heritage, uh, it's not just about a tax break. It's about what we can do to incentivize this and to maybe encourage people who otherwise wouldn't be able to live in Shaughnessy to be able to afford to live there, which I think is very important to make sure that we're not creating 
an elitist area, as many of these counselors have said and many of the speakers have said. So I will be supporting both parts of the amendment. Thank you very much. Councillor Reimer to the amendment. Okay, um, I'm going to avoid trying to say what other councillors might have said or not said. Um, to say, I had a question for staff around I, Mayor Robertson. Is that acceptable? Um, I'm just curious because the words impact and effectiveness could be quite broadly interpreted. I'd like to get a better sense of what you might report back on if we pass this motion. I, I know I'm kind of putting you on the spot on that, but I want to make sure we're not... We're going to get what we want back. So um, just off the top of my head, Councillor Rammer, what we would be uh, reporting back on is uh, the impact of the regulations that we would be adopting today. Um, on those 15 applications, how did they serve to um, assist with the basic objectives of the Heritage Conservation Area? How many applications have we had? We could do a totality on how many we've actually had, how many are for or for removal, how many are for going ahead. And we would do um, a bit more of the um, implications, I think, of some of the um, regulations and whether or not we needed to amend any of those. So we would try to do a fairly fulsome review of that, but I, I believe that it would be focused, because these are the applications, we would be focused on the impact of the zoning regulations. Okay, yeah, that was the word, because I... That could be a fairly large interpretation, but that makes sense. And then further to the discussion we were having on the previous uh, proposed amendment, there would be an ability to give us some information on the time and in inquiry, the time and application, like how this, how long these had taken in our system. Yes, absolutely. The, the time for review is not really, um, when it comes to the removal, as, as we've indicated through all of this, the removal actually has to come from council. So we need to be on a report on council. It needs to go to a public hearing. There's process involved there, and, and that's really one of the parts we can't guarantee so much. But we would certainly do a review. If there are any that come forward, we would do a review and report back to you on how long that took. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Well, based on that, I'm happy to support I. J is, is just redundant and potentially as a result of that creates conundrums that I very much dislike in policy. So I supported it when I supported the Heritage Action Plan research. Uh, I, I, yeah, I, I continue to support it but will not vote for a motion that could potentially create a conundrum around existing policy. Thank you, Councillor Meggs. Next. Just when I think it's being dull here, it gets terrific. I mean, we have a housing affordability action plan for Shaughnessy by giving tax incentives to people who own some of the most expensive property in the city. So I, I think we better drop that idea. Who would apply for uh, uh, any of these uh, permits if they thought council was about to write a tax receipt for them or a tax refund for them? So Jay has to, has to go. It doesn't make any sense. There's no evidence whatsoever that people are being held up on heritage. Uh, renovation because they are not being paid by the city. They don't want to do it because they uh, they just don't want to do it. And they uh, that's why we've heard about all this stuff about declining property values and so on. If we, uh, we have no evidence whatsoever that property values will go down, but this motion, Jay, uh, certainly would say, okay, well, we'll send money if you're not feeling good enough about this uh, renovation on your multi-million dollar home as it stands. So uh, that one, you know, is, is really beyond the pale. I'm going to vote against it. Uh, I... Uh, okay, let's get it back. But these report backs that trigger, uh, you know, an entire report, I think Councillor Deal's being generous. A memo back would be great. If there's a problem, then, then maybe a report on how to fix it. But the tendency to get these report backs relatively quickly, uh, you know, this could be quite soon. I don't think we need to debate this again uh, in the immediate term. You know, all, all signs point to this being a very successful program, and it's been endorsed by those most committed to heritage in the, in the neighborhood. Thank you. Councillor Affleck? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, well, I think uh, I is fine. I think that it uh, provides the ability for us to know for sure that we'll get a report back that will be in a public setting so that the people of Shaughnessy and the people of Vancouver will, will be able to know what's going on. Jay, though, I do have some challenges with, I think, regarding the, uh, the Heritage action, action Plan and how that f might f complicate it. I think it's actually generic in its nature. It's not specifically talking about this neighborhood, so it doesn't really uh, seem to have the influence that perhaps Councillor Carr is trying to to do that. I think that uh, we have uh, processes in place, but I also we have this, another report coming to us for the whole city that may have uh, an influence on decisions and 
policy for, uh, for us moving forward. So I'll support I, but I won't support Shay. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Louis. <clears throat> well, when originally proposed, this amendment was tied with the um, <clears throat> 15 applications. And so maybe a question to staff in regards to uh, when the uh, heritage uh, slash character home report back, re that report will come back to us because that did include the possibility of heritage uh, and character home incentives, a broad range, not just uh, property taxes, but density as well. Can you give us a sense of when that clarity might come? And I'm assuming when that report comes in the broader context that we could adjust or not adjust in context also with the experience that we might receive from the first to 15 applications. Mm -hmm. um, we expect to be back uh, in front of Council in early 2016, Councillor Louis. And we're, have we just started that work yes. now? Yes. Okay. So in, in terms of processing these uh, applications, I think um, it was a, it's a good question in regards to how, um, how they are processed and, and as they come through the door. I think there was some confusion around an inquiry versus an application, and it's important, I think, that um, we encourage people to come talk to us mm -hmm. before they put in a formal application. And that's when they come in, uh, they come talk to us in a pre-meeting, they go through an extensive process before they have an actual application. Is that, is that the case? Yes, we, all, we encourage people to come and talk to us beforehand. We encourage them to um, get information up front. And so we start tracking something, typically when the actual development application is made, not when there's, we're in the sort of inquiry stage. Thank you. So uh, even if they make an application through that, that's not what we're tracking. We're tracking when they actually make the formal application. So when we report back on the first 15 applications, it's when they actually have put an application in, not yes. when they just come and talk to us and they're interested trying to understand the system. We'll, we'll be, the, in terms of the time tracking, it will be when the actual application is made. We can include some information about the, the pre-inquiry um, as well, but the actual tracking of it will start when the application is made. Okay, and the reason I think I heard you say before was that when they come in for an inquiry and they start a conversation with us, there's no control of how long it is before they come back into us with an application. Mm -hmm. That that's, correct? that's correct, Councillor Louis. Uh, some people are a little more knowledgeable when they come in, and so they don't require as much information or take as much time to come back. If they have additional questions, others are not quite as informed, and they may take a little bit more time to go back and talk about things and maybe get an architect and whatever. So there's some flexibility in there. That matches with my thinking. Thank you. Okay, so we're at uh, our voting time for the amendment, Councillor Carr's amendment, and first we will vote on... Uh, the initial item, that's uh, I. Councillor Stevenson working on it. Okay. On I, we have nine total votes, unanimous support in favor. So that passes. And on J, everyone would vote, please. And votes are in. We have nine total votes, uh, two in favor and seven in opposition. Louis Stevenson, Deal, Reimer, Meggs, Ball, Affleck in op opposition to J. So that does not carry, and we have uh, concluded on those amendments. We go back to uh, the main queue. Councillor Carr, um, more comments on the main motion? Yes, is that one minute left? Yes, no, four minutes left. Thank yep. you. Um, again, my thanks to staff and all the speakers. I think the, the, what we really learned in listening to all the people who came to speak to us um, is, is that there are, there are two sort of sets of values at play here. One is a value in terms of protecting heritage in this city or protecting heritage in general for the public good. Um, the second is the rights of individuals to do what they want with their property. Let me speak first to that, that last point. Governments all the time deal with balancing the rights of individuals with 
the necessity to protect public good and limiting some of the rights of individuals in order to protect that public good. We do it all the time regarding fire safety, uh, regarding quality of air, water, noise, etc., retaining trees in the city for canopy cover. Protecting of heritage is exactly like that. It is protecting a public good and there are limitations placed on individual rights in order to do what they want with property in order to protect that public good. We know that the public good has been already on the radar for a very long time. 1982, the first Shaughnessy Official Development Plan made it very clear um, to, that the goal of the city was to protect the heritage of that area for the good of the city because it is a very unique and special area that gives our city its character, that captures a piece of our history. And that um, uh, in 1982, we made it clear as a city, pre-1940 homes were the areas or were the homes to be protected in an area where it was more than just the protection of, of protection of homes, it was also the protection of the character of the area in terms of the landscaping um, and, uh, and, and the, um, uh, the whole of that piece of Vancouver. Um, so the goals being there, the urgency is very clear. Um, there were 353 properties uh, that were identified of heritage value, but 43 were already demolished so only, th and, and seven added, so only thir 317 are on the new registry. There's already been a pace of change that's happened Be um, because the official community plan established in 1982 was not adequate enough to be able to prevent um, those um, homes from being demolished. Um, in, in terms, so we had to do something. We abs and we put a one-year moratorium on. That's expiring October 6th. We have to act now. Um, in terms of how those actions play out, there are concerns of individuals that they need to tear down homes because of the interior quality of them. We've, it's been made very clear in questions and answers that renovations can take care of every single one of those problems in terms of mold or in interior quality, et cetera, modernization. Um, in terms of the, um, uh, the concern raised around value of property, we've heard back from Coriolis Consulting and from individuals who came to speak to us who said clearly that um, the value of property in a heritage conservation area where they have existed in many, many other places has been to retain the value or even increase the value. So I think that that's an unfounded fear. Um, in terms of, um, of the um, overall question then, oops, I am out of time. The overall question really is to protect the public good, in this case, the heritage character of First Honesty. I support the motion. Thanks, Councillor Carr. Councillor Affleck. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I think Councillor Carr addressed that, sort of touched on the issue which has been a challenge for us here, which is the rights of, of uh, protecting, uh, to protect the, the heritage and also the rights of the individuals. Uh, you know, when does government get involved uh, and when is government too involved? I have the pleasure of sitting on not only the First Shaughnessy Design Panel uh, as, an, as a counselor, as well as on the Heritage Foundation as a liaison for both of those. Uh, it is a pleasure to sit on both of those uh, committees um, and boards because uh, I get to see the passion uh, that the people who are on those uh, have for protecting heritage uh, in the city. And, and the Heritage Foundation, within I've been on there for four years, and within that time they did their study, which was uh, the basis of what I think is this, as well as the Heritage Review coming forward uh, next year, which is that people in Vancouver uh, want to protect the heritage of our city in any way we possibly can. Uh, however, we have to also weigh on how involved we get in as a government. In the case of Shaughnessy, I think this is a perfect example where perhaps we need to be very engaged in the process. Uh, seeing the struggle that the uh, Shaughnessy design panel has uh, uh, with the projects that come forward to them is telling in that uh, there is uh, their, their commitment to the projects and their involvement and their desire to create a, an amazing community, a jewel in our city is, is there, but also their frustration over the last several years to see this uh, significant uh, loss of uh, some beautiful houses uh, through neglect, uh, it was show, proving the weakness of the, the current policies we have. 
what we have today is, uh, while restrictive in its nature, uh, highly restrictive for a neighborhood, uh, I think it's an important uh, policy uh, structure that we're creating here. Uh, it's important because I think that uh, no matter what you think about the incomes of people in Shaughnessy, uh, we have to think about Vancouver as a whole. And this neighborhood is very, very special, not only in Vancouver, but in the British Columbia and in Canada, and if not the world. It represents a time uh, where uh, the, the, the development was built with a, an end in mind, with a, with a whole look. That's very unusual. Uh, we don't have a lot of history. I'm, I live with a, a Brit. She's, uh, she laughs at the fact that we care about things that are 100 years old. She lived in a house that was 400 years old in England. So, uh, so I think uh, while we're protecting houses that are just under 100 years old or a bit more, uh, we are also uh, protecting houses that one day potentially will be 400 or 500 years old. There is proof that uh, wood structures, quality wood structures, and we have one in Vancouver, uh, in the south side of southwest of Vancouver, where uh, there is a house that is four, over 400 years old. And so it is possible to protect a house and keep a house made of wood for many, many, many years. And uh, this, perhaps, is the first step towards that, to see that my children and my children's children will one day be able to see a beautiful neighborhood that represents a special time in our city. It's changed as this community might change. It's, it's evolvement, or as it evolves, as a <clears throat> the community might uh, change and how who lives there uh, and the kinds of density that we might see. In, and this is part of that, that we can maybe really fit some more people in there. Uh, but uh, it's the look and the design, the landscaping uh, that is important for us to keep. And so therefore, I will support this today and please do that and look forward to the next First Shaughnessy and next Heritage meeting to, to hear the response from both of those groups. Thank you very much. Thanks, Councillor Affleck. Councillor Reimer. Thanks, Mayor Robertson. Um, you know, Councillor Dio and most recently Councillor Affleck and many in between have spoken very eloquently to the, uh, to the value of heritage and how that was demonstrated um, from the community and the speakers. In fact, notably, I would say that you know, it wasn't sort of for speakers and against speakers. There was a wide range of speakers. And I think many of those who, who expressed concern about the impacts this would have on them personally were still very supportive of the idea that heritage is a, a public value that, that should be um, valued in public policy by council. So, so that was encouraging to see because um, this is a, a debate that spreads beyond Shaughnessy in the city to other areas and the value of the heritage there. So I think for me what really it came down to is, is this a reasonable balance? Because it is a challenge always to take public good on one side, private interests on the other, and try and weigh off what a reasonable balance is. Um, and a, a sort of corollary question is, would more consultation and more time and more investigation uh, lead to a better balance that more, sorry, that a, a balance that more of the speakers that came to speak to us could have felt better about? Um, on the latter question, um, and Councillor Di Genova, I wrote it down verbatim, so I'm not trying to put words into your mouth, but um, you quoted that it was a lengthy process with lots of consultation. And I, I, my own feeling was that, very similar, that, that we could keep going, but there was a lot of consultation, and would it lead to a, a more refined process that more people would buy into? Not from what I could see. I think, if anything, it seemed to be diverging as opposed to converging. And I think most notably um, is this issue that there were facts on the table, but also opinions about what might happen. And at this point, um, not dissimilar to my experience with the laneway debate, you kind of need to do it to know what's going to happen um, and have this, and I appreciate Councillor Carr putting the, the motion in to do the review so that we can understand some of the finer grain of impacts um, and make sure that the policy appropriately responds to those. And um, the last thing I wanted to say was that um, the one thing that I did find, I think, the most concerning in the course of the debate was the testimony that was provided to us and evidence to support that testimony um, that heritage conservation areas actually don't decrease property value, they increase it um, quite substantially compared to areas, neighboring areas that don't have HCAs. Um, I'm not as concerned about it for Shaughnessy um, as I am for, and, and I bring it up because I know we, uh, we are having a heritage action plan across the city. Most of the, in fact, all of the areas of this city that have affordable rental housing are heritage areas in some state of, of uh, lower repair, let's say. They're older houses, they haven't um, been looked after, and I, I do have grave concerns that we're not, I would want to make sure that we were adequately considering that. So I will be watching Shaughnessy because it'll be our first HGA to see 
um, if it does impact property values and, and bring them up, um, as it has done in many other cities that have these. Um, and I, I did want to rise and make sure that staff were thinking about that when we're looking at the Mount Pleasants and the, Gath or the Strathconas and the West Ends and the Marpoles and, and areas of the city where this could have a very negative impact on um, an already precarious rental population. Okay, thank you, Councillor Reimer. No further speakers on this. Um, so we have been through debate and we're ready for the question on the motion and that has been amended. We'll go to the voting queue to vote on the amended motion. Okay, we have nine votes, all in favor. Unanimous support in favor of the motion as amended. And that means we've concluded this item. Thanks again to staff for all the good work on this and everyone who came to speak and participate in the public hearing. Appreciate all of the efforts made and uh, all the insights shared. So we are finished, the unfinished business on this item. And we move on to uh, considering the items that we have held for debate, separate vote, or because of conflict of interest. We had three reports held. And the first is our administrative report, 2016 to 2020 budget outlook. And Councillor Carr, you had asked for that to be held for questions. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, and again, thanks for the work. I really appreciate the budget outlook as the precursor to our budget. It, uh, it really helps put the context in place. Um, my first question is a really general one. Um, many times in this report, we emphasize that our tax increase, our property tax increase, is one of the lowest in the regions, and that um, our aim is to keep the tax increase to inflation. Um, there's a lot of discussion going on right now at large in Canada about whether during a time when people are worried about um, sort of a economic uncertainty, governments should be putting more money into infrastructure development or those kinds of things. So I'm just questioning whether it's still appropriate this year if we think that Vancouver is secure enough in our jobs and our economic outlook to not have to put some extra amount of money into, for example, infrastructure development or something like that. Um, uh, if we are secure enough in our own um, economic outlook vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. And um, yeah, so that's my first question. Uh, Councillor, through the mayor. Um, we do establish the capital plan as a four-year plan, which would have uh, approved was, was approved at the end of 2014. And when we do the capital planning, we look out sort of a 10-year outlook, and then for our four years, we look at the asset conditions. And so each of the asset managers bring forward what they look what they consider their needs are as far as capital. So that's built in a four-year view, and then it gets incorporated into each of the annual budgets. Council does have the option of, of adjusting the capital plan, uh, and we can do that through the budget process or through the quarterly uh, report. Okay. Um, in previous years, we've tested the public for their um, support of a tax increase. I didn't see the specifics in this, whether or not they would support for valued service, um, whether they would support... Um, a tax increase of something more than inflation, for example. Did we, do we know that? Well, Councillor, this is the budget outlook, which is just kind of the kickoff of the budget process, and it just sort of outlines some of the parameters and things like the economy and things to consider. That'll happen now between the outlook and when we bring the budget forward. Uh, it will, will, it'll be public at the end of November, and you'll uh, see it, uh, you'll um, meet on it in uh, early December. So through the consultation process that's happening in the month of October, we'll ask that question again. Previous um, years, they've been. It's been pretty consistent over the last two years that there's uh, some acceptance up to two percent, and above two percent, uh, it's um, a minority. Great. Okay. And my other question on this same theme um, has to do with uh, the fact that we have collective agreements, many, mm -hmm. um, coming to an end at the end of 2015. Um, some of the bigger agreements with our fire services and our police uh, uh, force, for example, um, have been arbitrated in, in, in the past. I uh, don't know what will happen in the future. Um, are, 
Are we, do you think we're safe to send the signal that we're hoping to keep taxes to inflation, given the collective agreements expiring, expiring this year and the possibility of, we don't know yet, but the possibility of arbitrated agreements? So again, that'll be sort of uh, brought forward at the budget time frame. This, uh, this report is really sort of outlining the risks and the opportunities, and we've generally given us a financial guideline to kick off the process that taxes aligned with forecasted inflation. So that's what's built into the outlook, but that isn't a decision as far as taxes as the tax rate. So that has to be thought through between now and the budget. What we do know is that historically collective agreements have grown faster than inflation and higher than our property tax. So for instance, in the last four years, actual inflation has been cumulative 4%. Your tax increases have been about 2% a year, so 8 and fire and police have been 99 and 10.9% over the four years. So yeah. it's a, it is a risk going forward that we'll have to is that consider. Is that why in the report, um, in Appendix 1, page 1, it talks about the full cost of delivering city services has not been passed on to property owners. It's, is that because we're sort of, we're holding to kind of inflation, but our costs have been higher? Our, our wage-related yes. costs have been higher, and yeah. we've accommodated okay. that through other initiatives. A okay, final question. Um, there's a statement on page two of the report that says, we have achieved efficiencies with technology and new service models. But now, um, that will take more money, more time, and will have a greater impact on the city and the people if we pursue those. What does that actually mm -hmm. mean? So, and over the last several years, um, often driven through the, the Vancouver Services Review, we've implemented new technology like permits and licenses, which putting more things online, our digital strategy, more web services. So that's helped us to improve our cost structure. Um, We've done shared services. So by new models, um, that's also a lot of our shared service, like bringing supply chain together, or finance groups together, IT. So we've done a lot of, of those big changes. Um, I think our sense is going forward, we're going to have to look harder to find those ones that could give us a big enough benefit. So we're going to have to think a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, Councillor Affleck, <coughs> questions? Mr. Mayor, uh, well, counter to counter. Councillor Carr, uh, I'm not a big fan of tax increases. I think that's that's clear in this chamber and clear to you, uh, Ms. Zimby. Um, you know, the one thing that I find frustrating over the you know, four years uh, that I've been here is uh, how we represent how what we pay as a taxpayer in the city and in the reports that we pr provided in council, uh, in the way we present it to the public. For example, the, uh, the, the Ministry of Community, Sport and Cultural Development, they have their report based on the average price of a home. And so just to give you an example, uh, the general municipal taxes on a representative house in Vancouver has gone from $2,538 in 2014 to $2,713 in 2015. That's a jump of $175 per year. The user fees have gone from $1,098 in 2014 to 1143 in 2015 for the rent. That's a $45, $45 jump for a home-based uh, home, and that they look at this across the region. Uh, when you look at the taxes uh, for a house dating back to Vancouver, 2005, the uh, general municipal tax has gone from $1,600 and $1,634 dollars in 2005 to $2,713 in 2015. That's a jump of $1,779. That's a 66% per percent increase in taxes uh, in 10 years. Uh, we often refer to the uh, the income tax or the pro property tax rate as our as our as our measure of success. Uh, I often argue that that's not the only measurement that the the, the, the all the other fees, and you refer to them, but I don't think we put it in perspective in this report. And I'm asking you to please, can you, for the purposes of uh, transparency at, uh, in Vancouver, and for the people to understand uh, what they're actually paying, dollar for dollar, it is in a fact we are the fourth worst uh, in, in the region uh, for paying taxes, uh, we, and you include the fees. And by far, uh, because of the property values, we get to take more money. Uh, even if you increase 2%, we get to take more money in. So I'm asking you if you possibly can include these kinds of, in, this kind of information, especially going back, say, 10 years, which I think is appropriate for, for budgeting, uh, to provide the taxpayers of the city a better understanding of where we stand as a city in this region. Councillor, in the full budget report, and so you'll get this when we come forward uh, in December, we do include a chart which is the total cost for a single family home of taxes and utilities. And it does show that Vancouver in 20, 2002 was below the average for the rest of Metro 
and in 2014, if I look at the last report, uh, has grown and it is above the average of the rest of Metro. So we do show that. that we show multiple different ways of looking at it. We look at the tax rate. We look at taxes. We look at utilities. But there is a combined single family right, That's a report chart. that comes to us. But the re I'm talking about the process, mm -hmm. the public process that you're about to embark on with the citizens of our city mm -hmm. uh, to engage them and help them understand and get their feeling, get how they actually believe and do, I get the sense that I think tax or people in the city, one of the reasons we're becoming unaffordable is because of our tax rates and our service charges. I think we're seeing it and I, I don't think people, we, we constantly talk about the tax increase, the simple 2% over oh, only, which by the way is twice the rate of inflation. And, um, and I couldn't find the Conference Board of Canada's report. I imagine you must have a, a special access to reports that the public can't see because I can't find any reference to predictable three next three years in public report. So if you can provide uh, a link or at least a detail on where this, uh, these predictions are coming from, because I can't find them anywhere online. So uh, that would also be helpful for okay. the people of the city, I think. You've asked a few questions there. Um, right. So first of all, yes, we'll make sure that we are clear uh, that utility rate increases versus tax increases, fee increases are, are clear to the public. Um, and as we do the budget report as well, we'll see if we can clarify that a little bit more. Because I think we're, we um, certainly recognize that utility rates have been increasing uh, higher than inflation. Um, the other piece is when you talked about uh, taxes going up, uh, we don't collect any more dollars when assessments go up. We collect the same amount of, if taxes go up 2%, the city collects 2% more. What happens is, is the difference in uh, how assessment values change between different types uh, of, um, uh, of folios. So uh, single family homes have increased assessed value faster than condominiums. And so therefore, they're seeing a higher, ta higher property tax in a single family home. That would be different from uh, other properties that haven't increased as much. So, so if everybody increases in, in assessed value the same, everybody would, ha would see that 2% increase. So some are going up and some are going down. Yes, but you have to, I'm talking apples to apples when we look yeah. at the region and there is, the provincial government provides very clear understanding of an average home in each town uh, and how the tax fits into that. And I think it would yeah. be helpful for people to understand that, that there is an impact. 2% uh, yes. of $2 million is more than... So uh, any more detail now in, in the public can process? Add a little I'd bit more it. detail. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Meggs is next. I have to talk to Councillor Affleck offline about what's going on there. I mean, I guess, uh, uh, Ms. Impey, the, the assessments go up and the taxes are based on the assessments. It's not that the taxes go up and therefore assessments go up. Right. Which is, uh, anyway, that's, I'll, I'll try to clarify that with Councillor Affleck. Well, if property, if taxes are driving affordability problems, it sounds that way. But I'd be happy to clarify it in an in, a, in an in order conversation that's not across the floor. Um, I just want to go back a bit to the um, to the capital plan just to clarify. Uh, I mean, although the city spends about a billion dollars a year, uh, total economic activity in the city overall is many many times that. I assume so. I just we we fix the uh, just to confirm we fix our capital spending through the referendum and then apply it over the four-year term. Even if we could stimulate the economy, we probably don't have the uh, financial capacity to do so. Is that fair to say? Uh, yes, unless we get third-party funding. We'll make changes through the, the four-year time if we get senior level, senior government funding uh, or additional development-related funding is when councils made that those mid-year changes, right. mid-plan so, changes. Which would be very positive, but it's probably not enough by itself to uh, change the economic future of the city if there's problems with the global economy. No. Um, just again to confirm that, that in the survey, the community is quite able to indicate they'd like a 10% tax increase if that's their wish because we we asked for price, this is sort of a sensitivity test. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you say, in recent years, it's been about 2% that people have been comfortable. Yeah, I believe we've asked uh, uh, their uh, acceptance of a 1%, 2%, 3%, and 4%. Right. I think one of the things that's confusing and, and uh, is, is whether or not it's how we try to manage the, the uh, future impact of collective bargaining. So mm -hmm. could you just sketch briefly what context we're facing now? Because it's sort of an unusual challenge given the number of collective agreements that are expiring. Councillor Carr's pointed to what two that are very significant in terms of our overall wage bill. So if you could kind of highlight that a bit. And, and I think in recent years, it's been arbitrated at higher rates than have occurred in the, in the mm -hmm. negotiated agreements elsewhere. Yes, we, it is a unique year in that all the collective agreements are ending in December, so we're, we, we don't have clarity of 
uh, of the labour costs going forward as we look out our five years. But we do know through the arbitrated agreements, as I said, um, uh, particularly in public safety, are arbitrated, so they have had increases much higher than inflation and higher than our uh, other public unions. So police, over the last four years, the cumulative impact is 9.9% and fire 10.9%. Um, so uh, those are also funded by property tax. So there are a lot of other revenues uh, that are generated by those groups. So the pressure on the property tax really comes from the public safety side. So we do look at how we can find efficiencies across the organization to, to balance that out. But that is our challenge. So how when we, uh, do you have any idea when we will, I, I, I know the answer, so I should say it's pretty clear. We're not exactly certain when we'll be able to determine the precise impact of collective bargaining. I know Surrey apparently has begun bargaining with its workers, but it could be many months or even a year before we conclude all of the agreements that are in the. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, yeah, I can't say. The answer is yes. Sure. Thanks very much. Councillor Jang, questions? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayor. Sort of picking up on Councillor Affleck's comments, you know, if I, if I remember correctly, we actually survey Vancouverites as part of the public consultation as to their tolerance for how much they would like as a property tax, but also when it comes to fees, would you prefer a property tax increase or a fee increase or, or something like that? Is that correct? Yes. So if I remember correctly then, over the years, folks have said, keep the general property tax as low as you can, but we don't mind paying more in fees. And that the average household, if there is such an entity, uh, you know, can actually manage its own financial affairs as they wish. Is that not correct? Uh, th there is a question, uh, which is how would you prefer that we balance the budget in, and uh, consistently the feedback is that people prefer uh, fees versus property taxes because there's a sense that you're... Mm -hmm. you're um, you don't want to pay for something you, you don't use, right? So, for example, I don't use the community centre that much at all. And uh, why should I be paying, you know, as opposed to when my kids go, they use it, so they pay their fee and they're quite happy to do so. It's because they're getting something back for something. Yeah. It's kind of like our water rates, right? You pay a fat, flat fee, and, and really, to Metro, and then mm -hmm. well, if you use a lot, you've got a swimming pool, you get good value. If you don't have a swimming pool or don't take a bath, I guess you get a lousy value or something, right? So I guess it's very difficult, I guess, to really come up with this idea of what it costs the average householders because every family is different and everybody has different needs and, and it's not so much about your property value but what services you actually use. Is, is, would that be fair to say? I mean, I'm, I'm struggling with the idea of the average household. Is there such a thing in, in Vancouver? I don't think there is. Yes, um, I'm not aware of any um, stats that are out as far as total service spend per single family home, but we do track with other municipalities taxes and utilities, and that's what's reported in the in the budget. Well, it's sort of like some of the provincial numbers that were quoted just now. Mm -hmm. You know, sort of how do they actually calculate that, right? You know, like. You know, I, I must. I do st statistics, and you know, mm -hmm. you got to pick. What are you doing? Means, averages, what? You know, something like that. Weighted values, risk ratios. I have no, I have no clue what they're how they actually get that number. But certainly, as I understand, and you know, when, at budget time, I go out talking to citizens, and they say to me very clearly, no, 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 no I like to separate it out because I don't want to pay for what I'm not using. So you know, if, you, if fees have to go up to balance the budget, but I'm using those fees, that's fine because I'm getting value for the dollar as opposed to just a general tax increase. Mm -hmm. uh, you know. And why should I pay for something that I don't use? I mean, that's sort of what I think the surveys have shown over the last few years. Is that not so? Consistently. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Jang. Councillor Reimer, other questions? Uh, thanks, Mayor Robertson. A couple questions. Um, I'm neither for or against taxes, but rather um, very much in favor of us providing the services that citizens and residents generally, because all residents, citizen or not, must pay property taxes, um, that we provide the best services we can for the best value for money. So to that end, I was very happy when we moved to the system where we have the service plans with the metrics laid out. Um, attached to the budgeting information because uh, that, that that really is the thing like you can be for or against taxes M many less people are against services right they would like access to that obviously you have to pay for it somehow um, so will that be included in the information that people have access to in this process it's a fairly you know it's a meaty document when that's included Yep, this is uh, last year's document, yes. um, so it has all of the service plans and metrics and we'll continue to include that 
uh, in this year's budget, but certainly as people go through the consultation, they can review uh, last year's uh, data and service plans, and then the outlook kind of provides a little bit of a view of what may be changing and where some of those pressures are. Okay. Uh, and so between those two documents, um, we use that to get their feedback uh, in the month of October. Um, second question, which is a bit of a follow-up on Councillor Jang's question. Um, I, I have sort of become obsessed with this user fee question on the um, survey because I, I have a theory that everybody knows they pay taxes, whether they're renter, owner, whatever, the property taxes are mm -hmm. unavoidable, generally speaking, unless you're exempt or if we could get into that. But really the question on user fees, my concern is that people say raise them because there's an assumption that they're on somebody else, right? Um, so I, I'm hoping that this year in the survey we can finally get a question in that asks more specifically, are you in favor of paying more user fees for the services that you use as opposed to the more generic question that we've been using? Okay. I can take that back to our communications group and I think okay. we still have time to adjust the survey. That would be great because I think it's a more apples to apples comparison. That, yeah. Yeah, it would help. Maybe it's not, but I would like some ability, more information to be able to determine if that's what people really mean. Um, and last question, um, engagement strategy. Can you give us the highlights of it? So our engagement strategy will follow um, what we've sort of had in place over the last, last few years. So when we do the capital plan and at the beginning of, of the council cycle, we do a, a longer term a view of, of priority. So we go out and ask citizens big, bigger views on things like infrastructure and, and high level priorities. And then annually between those, uh, uh, that bigger consultation, we do more of a satisfaction survey. Uh, what are important, what services are important, how are we doing in providing those services uh, and the value that, that they bring and, uh, and tax tolerance and fee tolerance. So those are the main areas of focus for the interim and that would be this year. There's an online questionnaire that will be available starting tomorrow, I believe, and uh, through the month of October. Uh, that's our main way of getting sort of volume of feedback and we generally have thousands of responses. Then from, uh, we have a couple of ways to engage in person. So there are short surveys that are happening in person at a number of community centres and through our uh, Doors Open Vancouver. Uh, and uh, people are asked sort of three main questions as well. When you call into 311, you're asked those same questions. So those are people who are actually using our services and, and uh, uh, engaged in a particular service at the time. And then we have a stakeholder uh, workshop uh, where we bring in uh, members of the advisory committees and BIAs. So people who are maybe a little bit more familiar with the workings of, of council in the city and they provide some feedback as well, both on the, the budget and, and some of the, what we're hearing from uh, through our survey. Uh, so those are our main areas, so that'll be same, uh, similar to last year, and um, we'll be presenting that as part of the budget report and incorporating some of that feedback into what's proposed in, in the budget. There's also usually one open, open house uh, that people can attend. It's generally not, uh, it's sparsely attended, but we do, uh, we'll make sure that's available as well. Last year, I think we had two people and one of them turned out to be a former city staff member. <laughs> so, well, but you know, you, you need to do that and have that opportunity available for people. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Councillor Reimer. Councillor Louis. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, thanks to staff for the report. Uh, well laid out. I'm pleased to see that we're moving to a five-year outlook uh, model going forward. We were trending, we were doing one years and then we're moving to th we moved to three and now the five to match up with uh, what uh, the best practices are. Um, like others, the, the, I think the, the numbers are interesting but it's ultimately about achieving the services that are important for our citizens. So part of the outreach I hope is, is to still, uh, we've laid out what our priorities as a council are. Uh, we've laid out our work plans to a degree and, and what some of the results of previous years are. I think that's important to show what the trending is and how mm -hmm. previous years we've performed by moving through this model. Uh, but also what, uh, still giving an opportunity for citizens to engage with us and tell, what, tell us what their aspirations are in the context of some of what, what, what we're uh, proposing is also important. Um, the that the council traffic is back in the room. This property taxes versus user fee and the combination of them to, per, to pay for the services. Um, it is important, I think, for a review of some of the user fee uh, uh, policy that we've set in place, uh, specifically around the utilities component, where uh, we've moved uh, away from uh, property taxes to pay and, and debt servicing 
uh, for some of our utilities to save taxpayers money by not borrowing with a, through a pay-as-you-go model, and so that when you see the expansion or the increase of user fees for our water utility, for instance, it's not that suddenly water is more expensive to purchase from Metro Vancouver, but rather we've changed some of our policies here in Vancouver, and the intent of that is to raise fees, yes, uh, um, in the near term, but it will actually save us money in the long term. And that explanation, I think, might be helpful for our, our citizens wherever we're doing that, because it's not always that just because user fees are going up that we're not doing a better job, and it's not uh, getting the, giving value for our, for our citizens. And I think that might be lost on some of the comments that I heard from Councillor Rafik a little bit earlier. Yeah, so we can certainly make that a little bit more visible, because by increasing, for instance, the water fees, uh, we are taking on less debt, which then helps us um, with uh, lower the lower property tax over the long term. Uh, part of the fees do that come from Metro are um, increasing faster than inflation, so it is a combination. But a lot of that is because we're investing in the infrastructure around um, the water and, and sewer treatment. So it uh, so that is flowing through that a higher capital investment there, but it comes through the utility fee. So there are a few combinations, and we can make that a little clearer. Just just to it, there's. It's not as if the fees are going up due to operations, but there's actual investment into mm -hmm. uh, hard capital physical assets that are occurring around the region, and we need to pay for them. The operational costs are actually reasonably small out of our most of our utilities. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Councillor Louis. Someone want to move recommendations? Moved. Councillor Louis, you got the mic on over there. Any debate on the motion? Moving the rec. Or Move receipt. Okay, all those in favor? Any opposed? And that carries. So we're on to policy report number one, which is the CD1 rezoning for uh, 3063 to 3091 West Broadway. Councillor Carr. Yes, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Do we need a motion to extend, or is that going to be fine? Uh, we may as well do that now. Okay, well, I'm you want to move extension uh, to complete the agenda. Extension to complete the agenda. Okay. Any debate? All, all those in favor of extending the agenda to complete? Uh, any opposed? That carries. Councillor Carr yes. on policy well, report you. one. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have three questions, Mr. Monroe. Um, first of all, uh, I was wondering what the authority is in, in where, where, which kind of policy document I can look to for increasing the height above four stories. Um, this is a five-story building. It's four, so for four stories. And if, you, if there's any, I mean, normally there's a plan or something that says you can ex exceed the height uh, based on these circumstances. I'm just looking for the authority or the, the, the authoritative document that gives me direction on that. Um, uh, Kent Monroe, Assistant Director of Planning. Um, the authority would be under the Rental 100 Secured Market Rental Program, which allows for increases in height and density for rental housing projects. Good to know. Okay, thank you. Um, my second question. Um, there is a massing uh, impact, it states, on um, the uh, two-family dwellings uh, that that have, this is on page seven, minor incursions of shadowing. Uh, I didn't get a feeling for how much of that shadowing there is or sort of what those, the extent of those impacts. I'm wondering if those could be, if more detail could be provided. Yes, certainly. We, we uh, will bring all the shadow analyses to the public hearing. It's difficult. We don't normally put them in the report because they're so small, they're really yeah. hard to read. So. Yes, true enough. Okay, thank you very much. And my third uh, question, um, regarding, it's on page nine, and it's, um, there's a covenant around parking. I did not understand what that covenant originally had asked for. It's an older covenant. And, um, and there has to be some mitigation about whether parking be achieved. I simply didn't understand what the original covenant was all about. And right. yeah. I have Rachel Harrison here, who is the file manager, and she can Great. answer that question. Thank you. Hi, Rachel Harrison. Yes. Um, so the original covenant, uh, it originated from a property a couple of stores down um, from Calhoun's. And uh, it used to be, I guess, a commercial 
a, ret a retail store and then it converted to a restaurant. They needed to provide more parking and they didn't have enough parking to provide on site. And so this site that we're looking at here today um, allowed some of the parking or said, we'll, we'll provide some of your parking um, on our site. And so as this site is being rezoned, that, that covenant is being extended. And so they're going to have to find parking if they can. I understood that they had to find parking, but I didn't understand that. If you could make sure that that's clear in the presentation, I think, at the time of public hearing, because it was confusing for me, and um, yeah, okay. that would be good. Sure, no problem. Yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. I'm prepared to move the, the um, a recommendation to refer. Okay. And anyone else have questions? We have a motion moving the recommendations. All those in favor? Any opposed? And that carries. Thank you for that. We go on to policy report number four. And again, uh, Councillor Carr, you wish you have questions on uh, CD1 rezoning for 26 East First Avenue. Um, again, I think I have three questions, or maybe four. Um, there's a, a detail uh, in this report that talks about the height vis-a-vis -vis stories and how high each floor is and then the additional two on top. And it talked about a 9.6 foot um, height in the, in the, between floors as being some important measurement for determining overall height. Are the, I did, but I didn't understand whether or not the floors are actually 9.6 9 feet or less. Is that, tr is that true or is that, is that the reason why this was included? I'm, I'm not Yardley quite sure why the 9.6 feet. Uh, Yardley McNeil will help. <laughs> Um, Yardley McNeil. Uh, it's a uh, description in the Southeast Falls Creek o official development plan which talks about optimum heights versus maximum heights. Optimum height being the number of stories of a building, maximum height being a, an actual dimensional uh, number. For this site, the optimum height uh, was determined to be um, a number of stories lower than the building is today. And it's based on a 10-foot floor to floor, meaning right. every floor is 10 feet from the floor slab to the floor slab above. Right. If you put in a shorter floor slab, a shorter height, like 9 feet 2, you can end up with an, more stories than yes. you could otherwise. And, and it's a, a point that we'd like to just explain to people that because we did have con some concerns at the open house that the number of stories were greater increase than what they anticipated through the ODP, which is correct. However, with a shorter floor to floor, you can get in another story. With the additional penthouse uh, guidelines, you can add two more on top right. of that. And okay. so in essence, it's complying with all of council's policy. Okay, so th that's, that's what I thought, but I didn't get clear if this proposal actually is 9.6 feet, which gets you the same number, the same height despite one extra story. Yes, is that right? Yes. Okay, maybe make that, that clear. Yeah. That it, that, so that this proposal is at the 9.6 feet because it's not specified elsewhere in the document. Okay, that's great. Um, my second question has to do with shadowing on East Park. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it, oh, you, you're right, Mr. Monroe, they, those little shadows are very little, those diagrams. But it, it looked in some of the further, on page two of the shadowing diagrams, mm -hmm. the last page of the shadowing diagrams, it, it looked like there was quite a considerable amount of shadowing on the park. I wonder if you can provide for public hearing kind of a percentage, like how much of that East Park is actually, would be estimated to be shadowed. Um, I think there's a, there's a June date and a March date in there, I think. Yeah, there are three times throughout the year, and we'll bring information back to you at the open. Thank you. Open can you do you have the December shadowing? Uh, we Was do. Is it done? Uh, you bring that back for public hearing? Yeah, okay. Thank you. Um, there's a, a point raised on page nine, which is, it states shadowing is within the expected scale of development for this site. I Does didn't quite understand that. Any building on this site is going to shadow the park. And so we're in the slope because of the height of the building that's allowed through the ODP is 47 meters. So what we're really doing is just adding two more floors on top of that in conjunction with your original pen, the penthouse stories policy. So we know that part of the East Park will be shadowed by any development on this property and our estimation is that additional two floors is within the scope of what's acceptable. Got it. Okay. That's, that's also I think a good thing to explain yep. to people. There's, I'm sure there'll be concerns. And my final question is on, um, 
uh, results from a point made on page 10, which is that there was a no development covenant from an original zoning. What is a no development covenant? It's a covenant that restricts development. <laughs> oh, yes, <laughs> through the way. It was part of the original 2006 rezoning, which has, this site has three sub areas. Yes. The uh, developer Pinnacle decided to develop the first one fairly yes. early on, and yes. this is the last of the three. Yeah. The um, benefits flowing from that rezoning were a community amenity contribution. Right. And the notion was that the, um, in order to secure that contribution, uh, staff applied an, uh, a no development covenant onto this last parcel so that they couldn't build it unless they paid out that original offering from 2006. They've now come to develop the last of their three parcels. Yes. We know that there's an outstanding obligation from 2003, which would restrict development until they pay it. Yes. And that's the note that's in. Page oh, so the, okay. So I, I think a few more details about that would be interesting um, to be presented at public hearing. Thank you very much. Councillor Louis, questions? Thank you. I'll just take this uh, opportunity to uh, perhaps ask for a bit of information to report back on at public hearing. The child care allocation uh, within the CAC, I've lost the thread. Originally, when Council back in 2005 said five child care centres, it was reduced down, subsequent term, reduced down to three uh, child care centres. Some have been um, produced, some have not. Uh, where is that and how will this uh, money is being allocated? Are they going towards those um, facilities that are uh, existing or, or in, in process or are we building out that third one now? So where's, where are we in child care with Southeast Falls Creek? And, you know, because we're collecting slightly more CACs than was originally planned for. Uh, there was some financial situation happening in the general area. And now uh, we're finding ourselves uh, with some opportunities as a result of increased densification in, in certain areas. So is there, I think, an opportunity to, uh, to relook at the area of overall child care, moving back to the original five child cares, if it's necessary, of course, but um, you know, where, what that context is. Uh, Councillor Louie, we'd like to come back to the public hearing with an um, overview of where we're at in terms of the public benefit strategy for the whole area. Because you're right, um, uh, there's a number of benefits that have been achieved, and there's a few that we're still working on, including a child care. So. Good. Thank you. Okay. And the mover, Councillor Carr, you will move. Recommendations on uh, P4. Any debate? All those in favor? Any opposed? And that carries uh, unanimously. So we have concluded all of those uh, reports and we need a motion to rise from committee of the whole. Councillor Meggs and then all those in favor rising, any opposed? And that carries and we need a motion to adopt the report of committee of the whole. Councillor Carr seconded by Councillor DiGenova, all those in favor, any opposed? And that carries and we go on to bylaws. We have 11 bylaws on the updated agenda for consideration by council. Does any member wish to hold any of the bylaws for debate separate motion or because of conflict of interest? Uh, Councillor DiGenova, did you? Yes, uh, Mr. Mayor, I had already declared a conflict of interest on uh, items one and two, so I will not be voting on the bylaws. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, with respect to the rest of the bylaws, bylaws five through 10 are related to the public hearing that was held July 21st, 28th, and September 15th, and the unfinished business item on this agenda. Uh, therefore, uh, those who were not in attendance, who uh, advised earlier in today's meeting during the unfinished business matter, they had reviewed the proceedings, which they missed, may now uh, also vote on the bylaw enactments. Uh, so those council members who are now eligible to vote are Councillor Ball, uh, Councillor Louie, and Councillor Reimer. And I will not be voting on those bylaws. Uh, Councillor Jang, you were absent from the... Uh, public hearing, but may vote on the bylaw enactments. Uh, if you confirm you've reviewed the proceedings of the hearing. Okay, Councillor Jang will not be voting on the bylaw. And uh, so we need a motion for adoption of bylaws one through 11. Councillor Deal and I'm seconder for that. 
So Councillor Carr will second. Any debate on adoption of bylaws? All those in favor? Any opposed? That carries unanimously. And the list of the approved bylaws, all 11 of them can be viewed uh, on the city's website. All of the uh, content there. And we go on to motions on notice. We have five motions on notice today. And the first is by social city certification, which is to be moved by a Deputy Mayor Reimer. Is there a seconder for that? Yeah. Councillor Louis jumped in there and he will second it. And we'll go to Councillor Reimer to introduce her motion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mayor Robertson. Um, so I'm pleased to bring this motion forward from By Social Canada. As councillors know, we have passed a number of policy pieces over the last three years, um, specifically in the downtown east side plan, as well as the healthy city for all, uh, that commit the city to create a formal social procurement framework. Um, we of course have a history stemming back to 2003, to, uh, sorry, the 2002 to 2005 term of pioneering social procurement in the city of Vancouver. Former councillor Jim Green, as well as um, current councillor Raymond Louie and Tim Stevenson, um, very instrumental in advancing um, the piloting of that and what was possible so to the point where we can now put it into policy framework. So that's been done. Um, what we haven't done is uh, had access to a clear system of measures and metrics to be able to evaluate the success of it. And an ongoing issue is the certification of the suppliers as to whether they meet the criteria that we're looking for. Um, and that's been a very cumbersome process for staff to go through one by one. And without those tools of metrics, benchmarks, and certification, it's very hard to scale it up beyond the city of Vancouver into the private sector. Uh, the nonprofit sector that may also be looking for social procurement. Um, we just had Startup Week in Vancouver, and I can't tell you how many tech companies would prefer to be having some sort of social procurement framework but don't have access to the tools that they need to do that. So all to say that by Social Canada um, has come along. They are based on a very successful model out of the UK, and they focus on certifying suppliers and purchasers directly supporting the creation of market opportunities. So that's where uh, they might see an opportunity in some procurement that we're about to do or Van City or the new Microsoft office that will be here or other place that they feel that they could create a strong link. And they also support local social enterprise capacity because um, it's not easy for a social enterprise to be able to participate in the kinds of RFP processes that governments and large organizations have. So um, what this seeks is endorsement of the work that they are doing and ask staff to review the uh, certification program that they have and see if it would be an appropriate framework for us to merge into our healthy city uh, strategy policy goals. Um, to emphasize that one way or the other, we have committed to finding a framework. This is just an opportunity to use a framework that potentially is both scalable and already exists, so we would be able to to have staff time more focused on getting the procurement done as opposed to creating a brand new framework. Thank you very much, Councillor Reimer. And speaking to the motion, Councillor Affleck. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, uh, it's an interesting motion. I think that there's uh, some good stuff there, but there's a lot of questions that raised, were raised in my mind, um, especially the actual um, resolution where it seems like it's a, it's a given that this is going to happen. I, I feel like there are perhaps, and I'm not sure, uh, because we don't really have the comparisons here, that there might be some redundancies uh, in this motion, uh, but I'm not sure, to be honest, because uh, it's not clear in this. We don't really have any staff uh, to, to address this. So I've, I've put a referral motion uh, forward, uh, because I would like to get a bit more information from staff to ensure that we're not being redundant. Uh, I'm not saying I'm against this idea, but I think it would be important for staff to provide us with some clarity on whether or not, uh, as uh, Councillor Reimer talked about the metrics and certification and how we uh, look at these other companies that we use. Uh, but I don't really, uh, I'd like to see a staff to sort of provide us with some sort of clar clarity on whether or not we are uh, already doing this and if we're, or if we're not doing it, how will this fill that void? Uh, I feel that the, the motion itself is pre, you know, presupposing that it will succeed or that the, the fact that it's Basically, seeing, seeing staff considered by social certification, but, but I think they are directed. You are, we are directing staff in, this, in the motion from Councillor Reimer to actually get to work and spend the money. And I would like to know from staff uh, whether or not uh, this is a good idea um, and whether it doesn't, how it might fit into our current policy. So the, motion, the mo referral motion is there. Uh, the by social certification uh, 
the BSCC motion be referred back to staff to report back to council on whether the, uh, the, the BSCC is overly similar to existing policies or programs. Uh, one, and I think Councillor Reimer is referring to it in her uh, opening, uh, but not specifically. I found the one, the ethical purchasing policy from 10 years ago. Uh, you know, how does that fit into this? Is it the same thing? Uh, so I worry that we might be making a redundant decision today by supporting Councillor Reimer's motion, but I'm open to it if staff can provide me with more detail on whether or not it is. Thank you. Okay. So uh, you want that clarified or you want a referral motion? I, I'd like to refer this back to staff to come back with more detail. on. You're moving referral yep. at this point. Okay. So we'll go to an amendment queue. Councillor Louie, are you a holdover? Are you? Go to Councillor Reimer first on the amendment to refer. Okay, well, a few things. Uh, first off, the motion does direct staff to consider um, the by social certification framework as part of their ongoing work with the Healthy City policy implementation. So I don't know how referring a referral motion to staff is going to achieve much other than a lot of confusing complication. Um, second, I'm guessing you didn't have a chance, I'm sure it's been a very busy time for you, Councillor Affleck, to be able to look at the Bisocial Canada framework, and perhaps I didn't provide enough information. Um, but unlike the policy that you refer to there, it's not a policy, it's a framework for implementing a policy. And when we pass the Healthy City uh, Strategy and the Downtown East Side Plan, um, both of them have policy pieces, which is where we state the values we're trying to aspire to, um, but said that staff would come back with an implementation plan. So what this is saying is that the Bisocial Canada framework is an opportunity to use an existing implementation framework rather than developing our own. But it does, uh, in the original motion, does ask staff to consider it as one possible program. If they decide it's not, there's plenty of word, room for them to say, no, we'd rather create our own. I do think regardless of our own feelings on whether or not they're appropriate implementation body for existing policy, as you point out, that we already have. So I will not be supporting the amendment. I was going to rise in a point of order that it's redundant, but I think the point here is actually to kill endorsing the work of Biosocial Canada because that's the one piece that's not preserved in the referral. So definitely won't be supporting the amendment. Councillor Ball? Yes, thank referral. you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. I would support a referral because um, actually I did try to look up Social Canada and find out as much as I can, and I had some confusion over uh, the city buying a certification and the value of that to the city. And I was uh, wondering where we are in terms of ethical purchasing, what the differences are. So I did find several um, confusing elements here that I would like to have the opportunity to ask uh, staff about, and uh, hopefully uh, we'll have that opportunity. Thank you. All right, Councillor Carr. Um, yes. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, um, I'm not going to support the referral motion, and the reason I'm not is because I think that the intent of the referral motion is captured in the second part of the motion um, that is, is already before us, which is to ask staff to consider the biosocial certification during the development of a procurement framework. So I think that that's exactly what the same thing as the referral. Um, but what the motion does um, is something in, in addition to that, and, and that is to endorse the work of Bisocial Canada. I'll speak to that later when we speak to the main motion, but um, I'm prepared to move forward with that. And I think, as I say, um, the, the second part of this, the original motion accomplishes what the referral is all about. Okay, and Councillor Affleck, closing words on your referral motion. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I appreciate that. I think that the fact that endorse uh, the Bisocial Canada implies that we all agree on something that it stands for, which I don't think we have enough information in Councillor Reimer's report uh, in her motion, to be honest. And I think it's the duty of staff to provide that. We're, we're basically directing staff, as it says in there, to do the, to, to use the, utilize this system and to spend $2,500 a year to do that. I think that it... Point of order, Councillor Reimer? Um, Councillor Affleck is significantly misrepresenting the motion. It clearly asks staff to come back with their advice on the implementation framework. So, I mean, regardless of your opinion on the implementation framework, um, I, I do think that representing the motion accurately is important in council chambers. 
Uh, if I may, Mr. Uh, Mr. Mayor, the, the actual motion doesn't say that. It actually says, endorse the work of Biosocial Canada and direct staff to consider the Biosocial Certification Program during the development of the city's social procurement framework as part of the Healthy City Strategy. I don't see any uh, words in that motion saying, come back to Council. It's not in there, Council Reimer, so I, I don't know what you're talking about, unless I'm missing some words, or is there another page to this uh, B1? I don't see it there. I don't see any direction back to, from staff to Council. You are providing them the direction, as you said in your earlier statement, to consider this uh, by social as part of their processes. That has in no way uh, says it's coming back to council at all, from what I can tell. So my referral is to provide some clarity to us, to the people of Vancouver, uh, to understand what by social is, which from my, from my research is a partnership between several organizations, uh, accelerating social impact CCC, Open Door Ventures, Realize Co-op, and common good solutions. I don't know who those organizations are. I don't know how, what they represent, where they stand uh, politically. Uh, and so I think it would be important for us to understand whereby Social Canada is, what it is, and, and have staff provide us with information on whether or not what they're doing is redundant to what we do and what our staff do every day at the City of Vancouver. So I'm looking forward to your support uh, for an open and transparent government here in Vancouver. So, Councillor Louis, do you want to speak to the amendment, the buzzer here? Uh, let me just try to read this for Councillor Affleck. Therefore, be resolved that Vancouver City Council endorse the work of Bisocial Canada. So maybe it's, it's about separating that out for Councillor Affleck and Councillor Ball, that whether or not you want to endorse or not. That's one piece. And then for staff, then it says, and direct staff to consider, to staff to look at by social, which is the second piece of that uh, motion, I think, um, certification program during the development of the city social procurement framework as part of the healthy city strategy. So that's another piece of work. So I think it might solve the problem for Councillor Affleck. If he's not willing to endorse, then he can vote against the endorsation of the by social Canada uh, work. And then, but it is asking staff to consider it as part of the report back, right? Because it does say direct staff to consider by social certification program during the development of the city's social procurement framework. So um, that's the, the option. I leave it to Councillor Affleck whether or not um, he wants to vote in favor or opposed to that. But that, I think that might be the confusion for Councillor Affleck. Certainly, I, th I personally support the initiative and believe that staff uh, uh, should be uh, looking at this and reporting back to us based on this uh, this work that they've that's already been completed. Okay, looks like we have one more speaker, Councillor Di Genova, to the referral amendment. Yes, I will be supporting motion, the referral. Maybe. I think that it's very important, and and perhaps and uh, perhaps we need to look beyond by social certification, and maybe there are other better practices here, and maybe staff will be able to come back to us with that during the referral. I actually think that this puts us in a bit of, then the word's been used again, a conundrum, because we we may find a better practice. We may find other ways uh, through procurement, and by reporting, by referring this to staff and having them come back to us, they can guarantee that this is the best framework for that. Maybe there are others that we don't know about, that Councillor Reimer doesn't know about, that could come back to us here at Council, and I would have more comfort in supporting that, knowing that. So I will be supporting Councillor Affleck's uh, referral, and I thank him for looking into this. Okay, so I'm going to call the question on the referral motion up on screen now. Yeah, Councillor Meggs. Okay. We have 11 votes in, uh, two in favor, and nine in opposition. Robertson, Louis, Stevenson, Deal, Jang, Reimer, Meggs, Ball, and Carr in opposition. So that referral does. Okay. For the referral. Okay, good clarification, but that doesn't change the outcome here. The referral motion does not carry, so 
We're going back to the main motion and somehow our main queue is, oh, I've got Councillor Carr on the main queue. But was that uh, the main queue? Yes, as to the, yes, I'd like yeah. to speak to the main motion. Thank you. Um, yes, and thank um, I thank you, Councillor Reimer, for bringing this forward. Uh, you know, this is to me in no way dissimilar from the whole process where we have certification, for example, of building types, um, like like lead buildings, or we have organic certification, um, so that we know food has been produced in a particular way. In this case, um, uh, the BiSocial Canada certification process is one that identifies companies which have a certain number of practi practices which are ethical, ethical practices. And yes, they are in line with ethical purchasing policies, but it is a certification process. It's something different um, than just an ethical purchasing pro uh, process that a city would go through. It's, uh, it's understanding in the supply chain what, you know, what organizations out there are in line with the values of ethical pur purchasing. So it does some of that homework for you. There are other countries in the world that have these kinds of certifications. For example, the UK um, has got it. It's, it's fairly new. Um, it's not been around as much as organic certification has, for example, but I think it aligns with the values of our city, aligns with the policies we've created around ethical purchasing. Um, so I'm prepared to endorse um, by Social Canada, and I do want staff to consider, not, not to say, tell staff you must do this, but to consider um, the, in, uh, the uh, by Social Canada certification as um, an element that could be incorporated into our ethical purchasing practices. Thank you, Councillor Carr. Councillor Affleck. Thank you. I uh, appreciate the extra bit of time to speak to the motion. Uh, while I appreciate Councillor Louis' uh, uh, ability, help to try and see if there's a way to sever this. Uh, I, I still have a challenge, to be honest, because I feel like the first half, we don't have enough information on what biosocial uh, is uh, in this report. And I think if staff wanted this to be a part of our processes, then we should give staff the ability to provide a more detailed uh, report uh, with uh, unencumbered by politics uh, to provide us with why that would be important. Uh, for the city of Vancouver. Uh, so therefore, the second part, which I think is closely tied to the first part, um, we're and in my mind, um, you know, we're, we're, we're asking them to, to actually consider it. So I can't see how I could sever that uh, and not, you know, support the first half and then support the second half. The two are tied. Do we support it or we don't support it? In this case, I don't feel like I have enough information about what bi-social is, what, how it fits into our policies, whether it's redundant, whether it's, it's needed. Uh, and I don't feel like the motion uh, is clear enough, it's contrary to what my fellow councillors say, I don't feel it's clear enough on that it will be clear coming back to council in the future. I think we're empowering staff to make decisions uh, and I don't think it's appropriate when we haven't got enough information here today to endorse an organization. Uh, so I won't be supporting this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Louis. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, well, I appreciate the appreciation. But it's certainly, it's certainly clear enough in, in my mind uh, what we're trying to accomplish. I, I'll, I appre and I also appreciate Councillor Reimer when she started off by recognizing that uh, several of us here on Council still had started this, uh, this initiative, uh, this, this uh, direction uh, many years ago uh, with our ethical purchasing policy. And I, this debate is re very reminiscent of the debate that occurred uh, over a decade ago, when uh, uh, former Councillor Tim Lewis and I, we chaired the Ethical Purchasing Task Force here at the City of Vancouver, trying to advance the efforts and the leadership that our city is being known for in this, uh, in this field. And uh, the arguments are, are very similar. That it's not enough information, or it's uh, unclear to me, and it's, uh, it may not be the best. Well, it's not about being the best. It's about taking some action, moving us in the direction that we need to go. And we know that this is uh, a trend that uh, we are no longer leaders of. We, at one point in time, we were, that we had stretched ourselves and, um, and moved in a direction where others had not gone. And the fact was, that, and the proof showed, that it was the right direction. And in fact, in ethical purchasing, it saved the city monies while still accomplishing 
uh, a significant social good. This is that same vein of initiative, that same effort that uh, I think that we can show today. It's a question of whether or not you, as council, councillors, as individuals, would want to show that leadership and to, uh, once again, help Vancouver show the way to be a leader and advance the goals as set out uh, in, the, in the motion. So uh, I leave that to you. Um, I hope that the, the answer is yes, because I, I think that it's, it is a good step for us to take. And after all, many eyes are on the city of Vancouver. And uh, I think it's important for us to do not just the work, but also to lead and show the way for others. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Louis. Councillor Ball. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. I did do an, a lot of research in preparation for this. Um, in terms of trying to figure out exactly what bisocial was, I did find myself confused because there were a number of confusing elements about exactly what it would mean to the city to spend this money to buy a certification. And I question that. Uh, is something that we need to do at the city is buy certification. So I would have appreciated hearing back from staff on this issue. Therefore, I cannot vote for it. All right, Councillor DiGenova. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I just wanted to first of all thank Councillor Reimer for bringing forward this motion. I think that hearing from all of my fellow city councillors here, we all are in the same place that we want to move towards ethical purchasing. And perhaps this is an avenue that will help us do that. However, Councillor Affleck's referral, I think, would provide more clarity. And I have some questions. I have some questions about how many certifications the city's purchased, uh, to what tune is that costing us? And those are questions that I would just feel more comfortable having answered before I supported this and moved forward. That being said, I want to make it very clear where I stand that I do support ethical purchasing, that I do support uh, the city making sure that we make conscious decisions in our procurement. And I would like to thank Councillor Reimer. If I had some more information, perhaps I could support this motion. And uh, unfortunately, I don't, so I won't be able to. But thank you. OK, I've got Councillor Reimer with closing comments. Thank you. Um, well, I have to say this debate has saddened me. Um, over the last decade, um, the arguments have actually gotten worse around this uh, issue of social procurement. Uh, Ten years ago, um, when councillors were against it, they would just come out and say, nakedly, I am opposed to including social values in procurement um, at the city of Vancouver. Now they're wrapping it up in some sort of convoluted process arguments about how you refer a referral to staff. Um, because some language is better or not and some complications around understanding the difference between policy and implementation. So I realized I made two critical mistakes in writing this motion. And the first was that we just debated Healthy City Strategy Phase 2 on July 8th, 2015, and I had assumed that we had remembered the motions that we had passed, what, three council meetings ago, um, where we directed staff around the implementation framework. Um, and this is intended to merge into that implementation framework and specifically around the policy that we approved on social procurement where staff in the notes in that document, and I appreciate not everyone gets a chance to read every council report, but it clearly states that they are looking, pursuing frameworks. Um, second mistake I made was a comma um, in the text of the resolution. And um, this resolution seeks two things, endorse the work of by Social Canada, Oxford comma, and ask staff to consider it as part of work we asked them to do on July 8th, 2015. So Mr. Mayor, I would very much like to sever this motion so that it's very clear um, that these are two different pieces of uh, request to council. And hopefully we can get on with uh, the implementation framework on social procurement because it, it is, it has been a little disturbing to sit here and realize that after a decade of work on this, the same antiquated attitude still exists in regard to social purchasing, and the need for it has never been greater than it is right now. Okay, thanks, Councilor Reimer. And so we will vote on two separate pieces of the Buy Social City Certification motion. And uh, the clerks would put the two pieces up on screen. Okay, so we'll do the first part, 
that Vancouver City Council endorse the work of Bi Social Canada. Everyone would vote on that, please. Just missing Councillor Meg's. No, still not registering. Okay, we're going to try again. We'll reset that. This voting system is ready for the dust bin. We spent more time. Yeah, just Deal and Di Genova. Okay, 11 votes. We have nine in favor and Councillor Ball and Affleck in opposition. Okay. Councillor Di Genova is opposed as well. And we'll go to the second part of this uh, motion. And that is the council directs staff to consider the bisocial certification program during the development of the city's social procurement framework as part of the healthy city strategy. We have uh, Councillor Di Genova. You're not registered on the, the voting. There we go. We have 11 votes, uh, two, nine in favor. Okay, so we've got three in opposition. Ball, Affleck, and Di Genova are opposed. So we, that motion carries, both parts of the motion carry, and we are on to our second motion on notice, conserving water through measures such as a toilet exchange program, which is to be moved by Councillor Carr, and that needs a second. Uh, Councillor Di Genova will second that, and Councillor Carr to introduce your motion. Yes. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. You know, I think all of us um, really felt the impact of the drought this summer. And I, I know that it was a concern not only to us in this council, but to the citizens of our city, uh, businesses of our city, um, to proceed to stage three water restrictions. Um, and the discussions we had about vigilance and making sure our neighbors were all adhering to the restrictions. I mean, this it was a subject of a lot of conversation and a lot of anxiety. Um, and I do want to point out that the projection that, um, that is being made by the Internet Governmental Panel on Climate Change is very clear. Um, the scientific consensus in that group is that we will continue to have hot, dry summers and we can continue to expect droughts. Um, I also know that neighboring municipalities uh, had even more severe restrictions, uh, stage four restrictions. Um, um, as many of you know, I have a piece of property on the Sunshine Coast and there in the stage four restrictions, uh, we were not even allowed to water um, our gardens with any outside water tap at all. It all had to be gray water. Let me tell you, that's quite a schlep and I really thought about um, having, you know, uh, is the water separation within a home that would make it easy to divert um, water or to use water from your shower or um, your, your dishwasher or whatever. Um, so the point of my motion is to prepare us as a city for the ongoing condition of droughts. It is to recognize that our use of water um, is exacerbated by the fact that many homes, many um, people's residences continue to have old toilets, for example, where um, they uh, consume a great deal of water. The heritage toilets. <laughs> um, there's some pieces of heritage that are better to conserve. <laughs> Let me tell you. <laughs> oh, God. 
create yes well <laughs> I am not going to go there <laughs> uh, uh, and um, and that 25 percent of our water in our city is consumed in, in sorry in residential homes consumes uh, it's consumed by the heritage toilets um, and so other cities other regions have provided exchange programs mm. And those exchange programs have been very well appreciated by the public. Um, the city of Richmond's heritage, uh, oh God, I'm sorry, you have really thrown me off, <laughs> Councillor Chang. Um, the, I'm sorry. <laughs> the city of Richmond toilet exchange program um, has, uh, was well, well had well, a good uptake and it cost $100,000. That's what they put into their budget to do it. But it really does save in terms of water, we are a city committed to a green agenda. Becoming the greenest city includes um, not only mitigating our use of water and reducing it, but also mitigating against climate change and, and, um, and the, uh, the fact that we do have to mitigate, in that case, against summer drought. So my um, re resolution is to um, uh, ask staff to report back on the costs and benefits of various measures. Exchange of toilets is just one measure. Um, there could be many other measures, and I, um, I'm assuming staff has been investigating those as part of the Greener City Action Plan. Um, I certainly talked to um, our um, uh, Interim General Manager of Engineering, uh, Jerry Dubravoni, about this, and he said, yes, work is ongoing uh, on this. This is not out of line uh, with the work that they are pursuing. Um, and, uh, and I think we need to be thinking all proactively about uh, the potential for um, our building code and looking to the future where separating out the water pipes that serve, um, uh, serve the grey water system versus the, um, uh, the toilets <laughs> um, can make a big difference too in providing water uh, for, um, for the use in a drought-like period. Uh, also, water collection systems, of which there's a lot of information in the, in the media these days. So my hope is that um, this will receive the uh, support of you as council and uh, we can get something in terms of a feedback in time for implementation in the 2016 budget, if necessary. Okay, thank you for introducing that motion and Councillor Reimer, we have uh, you next on the queue. Um, Mayor Robertson, I do have a referral motion, um, which I sent to staff, uh, so it can come up on screen. Um, as Actually, no, let me not assume this. Um, June 23rd, 2015, this council made a decision to initiate a Greenest City Refresh Program um, which included exactly <laughs> these kinds of initiatives around water conservation as one of the 10 goals. Um, so I'm very much in favor of the motion. I agreed with it in 2009 when I voted uh, for the policy goal to decrease water use by 33%. I agreed with it in 2011 when I voted to approve the Greenest City Action Plan. And some of you might remember on that very day that we approved the action plan, the next report that came was on water conservation measures, including the establishment of a toilet exchange pilot program in multi-unit buildings, which has since uh, been responsible for exchanging 3,200 uh, toilets, give or take, uh, in that time period. Um, and a new program was launched just this year, as reported in 2015 to Council, uh, it was part of the Green Landlord Program to assist in our, our understanding of the toilet exchange with the hope of scaling it up as part of the Greenest City refresh. I also agreed with it in 2012 when I voted for the adaptation strategy. We were the first city in Canada, major city, to have a climate adaptation strategy which looks specifically at drought and the measures that we can take uh, to respond to that. And I agreed with it in 2013 when we passed the building code that had significantly improved water conservation measures including rainwater collection and separated gray water systems, as well as mandated requirements for the dual flush toilets. So um, I think these are all great things. I know that staff have talked to literally thousands of people over the last few months about water conservation uh, and other, the other nine goal areas in Greenest City. At this point, to, to sort of zip one of them forward ahead of all the other work that they've been doing seems unreasonable and unfair. Uh, and the good news is the public consultation is already underway, Councillor Carr, and has been actually for six years now, but specifically over the last number of months um, on water conservation. 
Uh, so it will all come back in time for the budget. So rather than create two processes where one has already done the work of this, I'd rather we just have it uh, all streamlined into one nice tight package that can come back uh, in, I believe it's early November, at some point in November, which is well in time for the budget. Thanks, Councillor Reimer. So we go to, I'll do an amendment queue here for the remote referral motion. And Councillor Ball first. Oh, no, I'm sorry, I'm a hangover there. Is that a hangover? Yeah. Councillor DiGenova. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mr. Mayor. Uh, to the referral, I won't be supporting it. I think the Councillor Carr has brought forward a very thoughtful motion here that actually moves us forward in the direction of other, what other neighboring municipalities are doing. And my colleagues would know more about that as they sit on Metro more often than I do as I'm just an alternate. That being said, many of our neighboring municipalities have programs like this. And although, uh, and I would like to thank Councillor Reimer for all of the work that she has done on this, but as she mentioned, the pilot project applied to multifamily. Uh, I, I think that we have a scope beyond that in Vancouver. And from some of my research, uh, older or vintage or heritage or whatever you want to call the toilet that, uh, that, that does not meet the criteria that Councillor Carr is proposing can leak over 300 litres of water per day in a single family household. So uh, excuse the pun, but literally we're flushing good water down the toilet here. So I would like to see this move forward. I think that Councillor Carr's uh, motion only complements the great work of the Greenest City Action Plan and what other councillors are doing here. And I would hope that they would invite that and want to move forward as many of the other neighboring municipalities. So I will not be supporting the referral. I would like to deal with this today. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Carr. Yes, thanks, Mr. Mayor. I, I also won't be supporting the referral, and I won't be supporting it because, of course, I understand and know that there's a, a toilet exchange program, program for multi-unit multi dwellings, but um, the Richmond program and others like it are for single-family dwellings. That's still a big uh, problem. We do not have this in Vancouver. I've not heard talk of it happening in Vancouver. I think there's an opportunity for us to be proactive right now prior to the next year, um, and uh, it's been, uh, uh, the kind, that kind of program has been extremely well received um, by individual residents. There's no requirement to have rainwater collection. Um, maybe we want to look at that. There's no requirement that we separate out the water systems um, in, in our homes. Maybe we want to require that. I think we need staff to uh, put an emphasis on this because of the urgency of the situation, which is going to come back next year or the year after the year after because of climate change. Um, so often um, a pointed motion like this can just get action going on something which can end up mitigating a problem. Uh, whereas if you allow um, a larger program to just deal with a whole lot of things, sometimes it, uh, single issues or single problems don't get the attention that a motion like this uh, will direct staff to do. So that is why I'm not in favor of the referral. Okay, Councillor Jang. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. I'm in favor of the referral. I do appreciate Councillor Carr's motion. I think she has identified an area in which there are some problems, you know, heritage commodes or toilets, whatever you want to call them, uh, you do, do use up a lot of water. But I think it's very important to wrap it up in the refresh of the uh, Greenest City Action Plan, only because there's other things we should take into consideration. When I was renovating my house and I got rid of my heritage toilets, uh, you know, we had to look at things also like the taps and all those dripping taps and all these other things. So there's, there's more to one source than just the toilet that's, that's wasting water. And it's uh, better and I think it makes it easier certainly for contractors and people doing work when they have everything in front of them as a single menu. I think what we have learned with um, building bylaw changes and when they're all done sort of individually and higgly piggly, all these changes that people get confused and lost and kind of lose sight of the big picture. But with a refresh of the Greenest City Action Plan, which includes the toilets, but also things like taps, also like drains, also like water supply, uh, things like that. When I went through the renovation of my house, uh, it was very important. It was much easier for folks who actually say, oh, these are the whole range of things I must do. And uh, it was actually easier in the long run to get quotes on it and have contractors do it that way, as opposed to doing things individually. But I do appreciate uh, the work on this, and uh, you know, it's. Uh, but I think it's just part of a bigger problem of water waste or loss that we have across the city. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Jang, and we'll go back to Councillor Reimer. Closing words on the referral motion. 
Um, well, just because I want to clarify so everybody's crystal clear, I, I know there's been some fixation on the pilot, and I apologize, Councillor Carr, it wasn't referenced in your motion, so I wasn't sure if you knew about it or not. Um, sorry, in the whereas section, uh, but good to hear that you did know about it. But the next thing I said after that is the whole point of the pilot was for staff to better understand the mechanism and how they would scale it out across the city. So when this motion came up, I sent a note to staff saying, will it be considered as part of the Greenest City refresh, a permanent um, toilet exchange? Their response, we will be seeking council approval in November for an expanded water conservation program, which will include a larger program targeting rental and low income housing toilet retrofits and other efficient fixtures. So I, I feel like that email could have been sent by the mover of this motion and you might have gotten a similar response. So rather than declare this redundant, which it frankly is based on what staff are already doing, let's refer to them in case there's something there that <coughs> I'm not seeing that staff aren't already doing, but that Councillor Carr believes could add to the work that they're doing and then everybody's happy. It'll come back well in time. Staff have already done the consultation before Councillor Carr even thought to bring the motion forward, so it'll come back well in time for the budget. Okay, we'll call the question now on the referral motion. That's Stevenson and DeGenova. Councillor Stevenson. Okay, votes are in. 11 votes, uh, seven in favor, four in opposition, Ball, Carr, Affleck, and DeGenova. And that message uh, means the motion uh, carries to refer this back to staff and we have concluded on uh, number two. So we're on to number three, motion on notice number three, which is the current status of the Southeast Vancouver Senior Centre project, which is to be moved by Councillor Di Genova. Is there a seconder for that? Seconder for that motion, Councillor it, it was seconded by Councillor Ball. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> so, Councillor DiGenova, please introduce your Thank motion. Thank you very much. I'd like to make it very clear that I, I, I think uh, we were all in a bit of a lull. Perhaps our blood sugar is low because we're eating a little later today, but Councillor Ball did uh, second this motion. Uh, first of all, Mr. Mayor, I, I'd like to say that I, I know that... Uh, Everyone here will join me, I hope, in, uh, in, 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 I would say, expressing the sentiment that we all are trying to work forward to moving forward the Southeast Vancouver Senior Centre. At this point, I'm hoping it will be built by the time I'm a senior. But that being said, uh, I, I do know that there have been certain, uh, I, I would say, victories over the past few weeks in moving forward with the centre. However, we do have a federal election looming. And Councillor Louie, as the chair of FCM, has brought this issue to uh, City Council on many other issues and drawing attention to the federal election, considering there is money from the Build Canada Fund for this project. And although we can say we hope that money will not be uh, taken back, uh, regardless of what party may be in power after the election, we're not sure. Nothing is certain there. And it is my understanding that we have not started to bill against the 375,000 out of the 2.5 million that we are allowed to for the design and build. And although it is a design build, there there is a certain amount of money that we could be putting forward and moving forward. We can say that there were a number of different uh, situations going on, works with the Park Board, with community centre associations, with the Southeast Vancouver Seniors Arts and Cultural uh, Society, but I don't see that as an excuse not to move forward with at least the architectural consultants and the work on the building moving forward. I think we all know that this will be built. So this motion, first of all, uh, just ask staff to uh, 
to give us an opinion on what could happen if if uh, the federal election, if another party was in power. Also, uh, with the Build Canada Fund, have other monies been uh, drawn back from the Build Canada Fund for other projects, either at the City of Vancouver or, or uh, at, I would say, in other municipalities, other projects of this scope or size or this amount of commitment? So that's a big concern to me. And furthermore, I think that it's, it's very important that we here uh, just Again, exercise, uh, I, I wouldn't even use the word exercise. I would say that we here reaffirm our commitment to the Senior Center and moving forward with that. And we let all federal parties know, as Councillor Louie and asking for a debate of all uh, federal leaders on uh, municipalities, you know, that, that we want to make sure that regardless of who comes into government uh, on October the 19th, that the Senior Centre is a priority here in Vancouver. So that is, uh, that is the reason for this motion and I do hope that all councillors will support it because I know we all support the Senior Centre. They've waited far too long for this project and let's move forward uh, while the money is still there. I would hate to see a funding par partner pull out. Thank you. Thank you, and Councillor Louis is <coughs> to speak to the motion. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, it's an interesting motion, uh, to say the least. Uh, inter I'm interested, though, in regards to its motivation and it, what gives rise to the fear that the money is not available. Um, certainly, there's been a number of announcements made by the uh, current uh, federal government. Uh, in January, they made an announcement, and in May, they gave an agreement in principle letter. And finally, in uh, November of 2014, they signed a funding agreement with uh, the City of Vancouver. And uh, these, these commitments are uh, held, I think, in high uh, uh, confidence that they will be delivering. I, so maybe the question to Councillor DiGenova is what is giving rise to this. Uh, in my conversations with all the uh, political parties, uh, well, not all, I spoke to the, the NDP and to the Liberal parties of, uh, that are running in, in that uh, area, that they are also very supportive of the Senior Centre and not sure what, what it is that's driving this. Um, I would say that the delays, as outlined in the memo that we had received back in January, I think, of this year from the City Manager, was that uh, there was an outstanding legal uh, uh, dispute from the uh, a Clarny Community Centre Association that uh, was making claim on the physical assets of, uh, of that facility and included as part of that um, situation was the possibility that this new senior centre would also be entangled into that lawsuit uh, and uh, it was asked um, of the Community Centre Association to disentangle that, to, to, to sign an agreement that would make it clear that the property um, would not be part of this uh, suit that is outstanding. And it, is part, it was part of the requirement of the funding arrangements between the province and, and, the, and the federal governments that, um, that we need to safeguard this, this facility and, and to ensure that uh, the city is uh, in control of this. So with, without putting in jeopardies, otherwise we would be paying back this money to the federal government um, uh, when we lose control of this, depending on what happened with that court case. Thankfully, what has happened now is that the Community Centre Association has signed an agreement um, and subsequent to that I've been assured that uh, from the General Manager of Parks that they will be proceeding uh, immediately with the three pre-qualified um, uh, tenders or pre-qualified developers and moving through to uh, RFP on the, uh, on the facility. So that's, uh, that's, that is good news. So given all that information, I, I do think that this is uh, a bit um, out of out of context with the current reality. Perhaps Councillor DiGenova wasn't aware that they, we, when she submitted this that uh, the Community Centre Association was in the, on, the, on the edge of having a meeting. They may not have signed, uh, but they did have the meeting, uh, I think, last Tuesday, and they uh, voted in favour of signing the agreement, which is good news, and now all the parties can start moving forward with the development of this. Uh, I have no indication and have not heard of a federal government when it, when it has changed, uh, ever pulling back funding on a, a project that has uh, received a funding commitment and signed a, a, a signed funding agreement from the federal government. But you know, perhaps uh, uh, I, I can be corrected on that. I don't believe that, um, uh, un unless it's, of course, a, a, a very controversial project, I don't see this being that. 
especially given that uh, I think that all parties have stated their support uh, in the past for it. So um, my, my preference, Mr. Mayor, is that uh, perhaps Councillor Dijanova can be briefed by staff, but rather than creating a long uh, amount of work for staff, that this just be referred to staff to brief up uh, Councillor Dijanova on, on the latest uh, happenings of this. So I'll move that referral. Okay. Councillor Louis moves referral. Uh, we'll go to an amendment queue on that. Referral motion. Councillor Di Genoa, you speak to the referral motion. Well, I'm quite disappointed that Councillor Louis has again decided to refer this. I know that he also has worked with the seniors and has promised them for several years that this centre would be built over 12 years ago, and he's actually in government and has the power to make that happen. So referring this again, I think, actually just disappoints the seniors and sends a signal to the federal government that we're not serious about this project, that we have not invoiced against that amount that we could be using right now in absence of any signed agreement. Yes, Councillor Louis, I did know about the meeting. In fact, I, unlike you, did attend the AGM of the Southeast Vancouver uh, Seniors Arts and Cultural Society. So yes, every step of the way I have been there and I know what is happening, but at the same time we do have a federal election looming and as you have said here in these very chambers about many other issues, funding is in jeopardy. And I find it interesting. Councillor Louis. Funding for housing, funding for... Councillor Genova has stretched uh, both the, the intent of what I've said and now made a statement of what I said. Uh, I've never said that the funding is in jeopardy for this, uh, this uh, particular centre. What I've said is that the funding agreement has been secured and that it was signed in November by uh, the federal government and on December the 5th by the city, in short order, directly right after. So we have a funding uh, agreement and I, uh, exactly opposite of what Councillor Genova has put forward. Thank you. Councilor Di Gentleman, can you address Just your to clarify, can you, if can you please adjust your comments to the chair? Yes, the uh, chair. Mr. Chair, I said funding is in jeopardy, not the funding. So funding for other projects, such as housing projects. Councilor Louis has brought several issues. Or a point of order, Mr. Mayor. Point of order, Councilor Louis. A point of order is that the uh, councilor should be speaking to the motion mm. uh, that is before us for consideration. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. And to the motion, yes, Councillor. I will speak Dijanova. to the motion. So every step of the way here, the seniors have asked. They've come to council. They've come in buses. They've begged us to start invoicing against that $375,000. And regardless of the agreement with Killarney Community Centre Association or the seniors, uh, we could have been moving forward with that to make sure that when we hit the point that we did have a signed agreement, we were ready to go. Again, I think this is an overarching theme of how we could perhaps be using better practices here to move development along a little bit faster, especially with the senior center. That being said, uh, I'm not sure that I agree, and I, I would question staff if any of the other funding for any projects in the city of Vancouver has ever been pulled back by the federal government. I, I just wonder. Uh, I think that that would be very interesting information to have. If, if uh, staff could comment on that, I would appreciate it. That being said, I think that we all share the sentiment that we should be moving forward here and referring this motion is only stalling the Vancouver uh, Killarney Southeast Vancouver Senior Center here. So. Uh, I, I would encourage all of my colleagues not to support the referral and instead to support the motion and let's move on with this. Let's see shovels in the ground and uh, let's make sure this happens during this term on council. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ball, to the referral motion. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Um, actually, I just think that uh, Councillor Di Genova has just done something very clear and simple here. She just wants a, a memo. It's not a gigantic piece of work just to assure us on three separate issues, which is what's the deadline, are we fulfilling it, uh, is, the, is the money being secured, and have we actually used any of it and invoiced against it. I think for us to receive that information would just simply be helpful and to help uh, make us aware that we're still working on the project and again that we are meeting the deadlines which are required by the various levels of government. So I really don't think this is complex. I don't think there's a problem with getting this information. I think it would be helpful for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor oh, Councillor Jang. 
I'm standing in favor of the referral. You know, it was, it's, it's a lot of something is being shoveled around here. I don't know what it is yet. But I just want to say that I opened up the paper and it said that there's an agreement had been signed and that the thing was going to get built. Yippee, we're done. And, uh, you know, and then I saw this uh, motion and for Councillor D. Genova to suggest that it would slow things up. I think the, that, that would speed things up. I don't think that's the case. Um, in fact, what she's asking for is a whole bunch more work, which just adds red tape, lots more red tape, red tape after red tape after red tape. And uh, how is asking, asking to do all this extra stuff going to help that thing get built? There's an agreement that's been signed. It's all going ahead. We've been assured by the general manager of the Parks Board. It's getting built. We should be celebrating this moment, not trying to play politics and say, oh, I'm, I'm taking credit for this, and I'm doing all this, and oh, no, look at me. I went to this meeting, and you didn't go. It's crazy. It's getting built. Let's just move on, please. Thank you very much. And Councillor Carr. Yes, thanks, uh, Mr. Mayor. I'm not going to support the referral motion. You know, I also think that this is a, a situation where there has been information in the media. Some things have been forthcoming recently, but we haven't. This is not asking for a report back. It's asking for a memo. Um, so it's not a detail. I mean, it's n not the amount of work that I, that I know a report back does require. It's a memo that simply clarifies for us something that is an, around something that is a very important project to all of us, us, all of us at the council table, that there is some information out there um, in the uh, in the media. Um, some of you may have more information than others. I think it's worthwhile to have a report back on this critical project that affects a lot of people. And it's just, I'm sorry, a memo um, on this. Sorry, yes, I did. Usually we're talking about report backs, but it is memo. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and also, you know, whether or not there's any risks right now, I'd love to know that. While we're in the duration of the election, it should be an easy process. So I support the original motion, not the referral. Thank you. Councillor Raffleck. Uh, well, I won't support the referral. First of all, I find it offensive, uh, to be honest. I mean, I think it's clearly a, a personal attack on Councillor de Genova. I think, uh, I, I don't think that's a fair uh, referral. I think if you want to refer a request to provide a briefing to all of us, that would be fine. But I think to exclude everybody else, but also just really focus on Councillor de Genova is not per, a particularly govern, uh, proper governance motion in my mind. Uh, I also think, uh, you know, Councillor Jang says it's getting built. He, uh, Vision Vancouver has been saying that since 2008. So I'm wondering when, uh, when, the, when is this thing going to get built? Uh, one delay after another. So I can certainly uh, empathize with Councillor uh, de Genova's concern that uh, uh, that this thing may get delayed once again uh, because of Vision Vancouver's lack of ability to govern the city in a way that it should be uh, delay after delay after delay. It's getting built, it's getting built not because of Vision Vancouver, that's for sure, it's getting built because potentially uh, NPA's park board's getting things done. Thank you. Councillor Meggs. Uh, reminded about the NPA Park Board and its 2% fee increases are just banged in without any consultation. I was quite shocked to see that, but uh, Councillor Affleck can sort me out on that one. Uh, what, I, what I really object to in this, uh, what I object to a lot in this is the idea that staff will, with uh, 22 days to go, uh, read the tea leaves of the national election and decide what impact that will have on something that appears to be in perfectly good shape. So uh, it's uh, just a small suggestion to Councillor Genova that in future when she has questions like this, rather than uh, trigger a large debate in council, she could make inquiries. And if she develops evidence that suggests there's some big problem emerging, she could then rise in her place here today and ask uh, our acting city manager whether those facts uh, should cause any concern. And then everybody in the, neighbor, in the community would, would be able to uh, assess for themselves whether there was a reason for a panic. But this kind of motion, which asks the staff to formulate uh, an assessment of who's going to win the election and what impact that might have on the senior center funding, to me, is frivolous. And, uh, and, and so referral is, is a kind uh, treatment for it because it's intended to stir up a debate about something that, uh, for whatever reason, the NPA thinks is in doubt, which it's not. And Councillor Louis, to close the debate on, on the referral. On the referral, Mr. Mayor, I think it's just important to uh, rise and state that, uh, yes, this has been a long process. Yes, uh, many of us around... This council chambers has been uh, putting an extensive effort trying to secure funding from the province and the federal government, and finally, we have uh, we have done just that. I will state that nothing in the motion as put forward on, and the action of referral will delay 
it will not advance in any fashion the process to go any faster or slow it down in any fashion either. This information is uh, superfluous to the whole process of construction of this facility. And to, to characterize it as anything else is, I think, uh, disingenuous to uh, the seniors who deserve more uh, than to have it uh, put, up, put forward that, a, that any uh, information that is not available to Councillor uh, Di Genova or any other members of Council that might not uh, be privy to uh, certain uh, information and be able to read the tea leaves of what the election will yield will make the centre go any faster. And I, I, I really do want to reiterate that uh, uh, the citizens in that section of our city are deserving of better. And uh, I think that uh, the politicize it at this point in time, whether you know, Councillor Africa with his, uh, with his efforts to uh, make these types of statements of nothing being built is, uh, well, again, inaccurate. But beyond that, uh, again, I think inappropriate is, uh, as he's trying to paint uh, the, uh, the referral motion. So hopefully uh, we'll... Uh, be able to move on with construction and we'll get that done as the general manager of parks says we're going out to RFP now how much more quickly again what other actions can can we possibly take but to do exactly that thank you mr. mayor okay so we go to voting on the referral motion everyone would place their vote whether or not to refer this And we have 11 votes in, seven in favor of referral, and Balkar, Affleck, and DiGenova in opposition. So that carries. And we've uh, concluded on that motion. And we move on to uh, change of business license hearing panels October 6th and 27th. Can I have a mover for that? Moved by Councillor Deal, seconder. Jang will second. Any, any discussion, debate on this one? All those in favor? Any opposed? And that carries unanimously. And uh, we have a fifth notice of motion <clears throat> is, or motions on notice, a fair and level playing field for Vancouver distilleries, wineries, and uh, cideries, breweries. Councillor Affleck, that will be seconded by De Genova. Councillor Affleck, uh, we'll go back to the main queue. Councillor Affleck, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I appreciate your time today. I think that this motion is really straightforward. It's fairly clear in its uh, preamble where it talks about the provincial government changing the rules uh, across the province regarding uh, the um, distilleries, wineries, cideries and breweries where they're allowing 20% uh, of products not from outside of that distillery or winery or brewery uh, to be sold in those facilities. I think this is a great opportunity uh, for a lot of these facilities, these, these companies that are succeeding so well since our previous decision on expanding and allowing them for taste to have tasting lounges. Uh, this new change from the provincial government with the 20% rule uh, will provide uh, these uh, companies to succeed even further by sharing uh, amongst themselves their own products, so really creating a robust network between each other. Uh, also providing uh, Vancouver with a uh, step up and a move forward for our competition in other communities uh, makes these changes. I think we have to ensure that we have a level playing field uh, and that we give uh, these businesses uh, who are already succeeding thanks to this council's decisions in the past. Uh, and I hope that this uh, move forward on this decision today uh, will be supported by the full council. I think that while you might argue that uh, we are awaiting a uh, full review of our liquor policies here in Vancouver, uh, I don't see any reason to delay on this because the, they are asking the, the companies out there, these small uh, craft places, craft beer places, these wineries, they're, they're asking for it. They'd like to see it. They'd like to see the change. They think it would be very, very helpful for them to succeed even further. It's great for tourism. It's great for business. And it's great for all of Vancouver. So I'm looking for your support today on this motion, and I hope I get it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Deal, do the motion. Yes, yes, thank you very much. A question for the city, acting city manager, if I could. Uh, Mr. Johnston, um, can you let us know I know that the motion refers to the, the liquor review and Councillor Affleck referred to it in his comments. Where are we on that? That's something that Councillor Louie and I have been working on for a lot of years. 
Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and I understand that it's actually made it to the top of the of the list, so especially now that we were waiting for the provincial regulations to be changed. So where are we on the timelines for that? Um, well, Mr. Chair and Council, the uh, as you know, the final recommendations I believe uh, by the province were made in July. So we now have clear direction of of what uh, what where they're going. And uh, so our staff are now wrapping up their work and will be ready to bring forward some recommendations to Council in the near future. Um, any kind of uh, idea on when that might be or whether we can have some fast-track items within that? Because there are several items that were sort of low-hanging fruit that wouldn't take a lot of changes from the city that could possibly be brought forward in a package and what that timing might be? Yeah, I think, um, I think we can definitely commit to bringing it forward in the next couple of months and we could look to some uh, fast-track or quick starts that we could... Quick starts. And do you think that there's a possibility of getting any quick starts before the holiday season? It's certainly something we could uh, look into. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I fully agree that this is something we should look at doing quickly. This was just passed by the province or brought forward by the province on July the 28th. Uh, we know through our history that there have been a number of other uh, pieces of relatively low impact changes that we've made, um, but we're now on the shoulder of doing this final review. And what I'd love to see is this package together with some other quick starts. I mean, I remember years ago when when then Councillor Jim Green brought forward a motion to allow there to be performers, uh, more than two performers with acoustic on a stage in a small restaurant. And his joke was at the time was that you couldn't have three mimes on stage. That, um, some of these regulations are so outdated. There's one that says you can't drink a beer on stage while you're performing in a rock show, which seems a little silly. So there's a lot of uh, fairly low-hanging pieces. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> Who knew? Yeah, I know. <laughs> anyway, so so if we could actually package this together with some other ones that uh, that we that our staff do not um, perceive to have a high impact, and brought, bring that back as quick starts before the holiday season, so that they can be implemented in time for for uh, for people's holiday time, I think that would be fantastic. And and take this motion and add more to it, as opposed to hiving off one thing because it's been lobbied for, and rightfully so. But there are many other pieces out there that could probably be changed as well. So I'm going to refer this to staff for to to. Um, bring into that larger, um, that larger policy piece, but include it in what would be a quick start and, and uh, ask that uh, that be brought back uh, before the holiday season. And, and if the package can't be, can you let us know so that we can move ahead on separate pieces if we choose to do so at that time? So that's my, my uh, referral is back to staff to bring forward as quick start, as, a, as part of a, potentially part of a quick starts program for the liquor review. Okay. So we go, I'll go to an amendment queue on that referral. And Councillor Affleck, uh, first up on referral. Well, I, that's unfortunate. I, I think that in business, uh, days or weeks can be very, very meaningful and very, uh, have a huge impact on your operations. I think we have an opportunity to get ahead of this one uh, in the region. Uh, in my mind, while I respect uh, the acting city manager's timeline that he say a couple of months, we really only have about three council meetings, if that, left before Christmas. Uh, so let's be realistic and say that this potentially won't come to us until the new year. Uh, we have budgets to talk about. We have a lot of things to deal with over the next couple of months, uh, potentially the viaducts, all these other issues that staff are dealing with. Uh, I'm worried that this will get lost in the shuffle. This is a simple change. Are, are, am I guessing, or are you telling me you don't support this simple change? I don't understand what the problem here is. Uh, if you're opposed to this change, then oppose it. If you're okay with it, then support it. What, the liquor policy, the liquor reviews are broad, in their broad reach is fine, but if there is something simple that we can change and make a difference in Vancouver immediately, we should take advantage of that. To discourage that and not to do that is not good governance. I think we have a chance here to really help an industry uh, and help the city thrive in its business world. Uh, it's good for tourism, and I think that delaying this is, is absolutely 100% political on the, on the case of, in the case of Councillor uh, um, uh, Deal, and I think that... Councillor Reimer, point of order. I can't believe we still have to go over the section of the procedure bylaw, but it would be impossible for Councillor Affleck to know what a motivation of another councillor is and not appropriate for him, therefore, to speculate on it. Thank you for that reminder, Councillor Reimer. Councillor Affleck, with that in mind. Well, I can only assume that Councillor Deal is opposed to this and therefore uh, doesn't want it to come to the table. She's uh, not supporting it. If she supports it, support the motion. Why refer it? What is the point? Uh, to push it into a bureaucratic nightmare of, uh, of City Hall? Why would we want to do that? What kind of, what kind of good work is that? 
let's get it done. Let's find, get it done and let's move forward and let staff deal with other stuff that probably they can deal with in this time. So I'm, I'm very disappointed that, uh, that this is going to look like the, to be referred. I think we can get this done today and we can have a vibrant industry as we have done in the past, made decisions that have really, really helped an industry. And it's unfortunate that uh, delay tactics are happening here today. Councillor DiGenova. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I will not be supporting the referral. In fact, it concerns me that we're referring everything. So our staff are going to have a hefty amount of work to do over the holidays here, instead of enjoying a cup of Christmas cheer, as Councillor Affleck is <laughs> suggesting. Uh, I, what I've heard here is a lot of history. This person did this, and this person did that, and we're going to take it back to that? I mean, it seems pretty petty. This is something very simple. We can be a leader. We can we can exercise best practices, and we can be fun Coover, or we can be later fun Coover, which seems to be the process we're going through in a referral here. I think Councillor Affleck has brought forward a great motion. I'm not sure, and I will not question the motives as to why it's being referred, but I would guess, I would guess from the comments I'm hearing uh, order, here. Order. Is she allowed to guess my motivation? Not, I'm not guessing a motivation. Point of order, Mr. Mayor, I'm speaking, and, and I, I'm not sure what Councillor Jang's point of order was. My point of order was that uh, you were once again uh, if you'd let me to me by guessing what it may be. Thank you. I have the floor. Thank of course. Councillor DiGenova. He didn't let me finish my sentence. Perhaps if he did, he would have understood what I, I was just, saying. Just very focused on the motion and no superfluous the motion, comments, please. The motion clearly outlines this. I thank Councillor Affleck for his work. and. Perhaps when this does come back through referral, uh, it seems that that's the new MO of this council, that uh, everyone will support it. I can't guess that that's what will happen, but uh, perhaps it will come back in the form of a staff report and people will then feel more comfortable supporting this. But I support Councillor Affleck's motion. I see no need to refer this. And in fact, I think that this doesn't just support, I mean, it supports so many different things here, but especially local businesses. Mr. Mayor, you had put forward a motion on patios that was supported unanimously by council. And I see this motion, it has the same sentiment here. It really is about a fair and level playing field. And referring that uh, only, uh, only asks our local businesses, distilleries, wineries, cideries, and breweries uh, to bear a burden a little bit longer than they have to. So I will not be supporting the referral. I will be supporting Councillor Affleck's motion, and I'm happy to second it. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Ball. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. I, I know that uh, this council uh, really wants to support small business and speaks about s supporting sm small business and recognizing the importance of small business in the community. And I do feel that the original motion actually was a concrete example of what uh, the city could do immediately. So I, I do find it sad to refer it because I think it would be a great help to small business in the community. I have not been personally lobbied by anybody about this, but I do believe in our small business in the city and uh, certainly think that moving ahead would uh, be the most appropriate thing to do. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Carr? Um, yes. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not going to support the referral. I, I wish, I, Council, I, I, I love the, the um, statement that, that Councillor Deal started out with, which was to support this particular motion and to acknowledge that it was a very good move and in, in line with what she sees to be important uh, for the, uh, the business community in the distilleries, wineries, cideries and breweries. Um, so what I, what I wish had happened was that um, Councillor Deal would have amended the motion to add a second point which is to come, ask staff to come back with some other quick start actions so that we could move on this one. If everybody's in support of it, that would have been the easy thing to do. And it would have acknowledged um, Councillor Affleck's um, in initiative on this issue. Um, and then, and if there is more work done, as Councillor Deal has identified, um, for, for her to have suggested um, a, an additional staff coming back with other quick starts would have been wonderful and, and I think would have shown a lot of collaboration on, on council. I do have a question that I would like ans answered and that is um, there was a, another statement that Councillor Deal made that I'm not sure if it was answered by staff or captured in that and that she said something like, I'm not going to say it's exact wording, but something like, and if 
you can't make it back before the holiday season where you let us know. Um, so I'd like clarification on that from, from staff, what they interpreted that to mean. And if we can get a quick response back on that, I think it would be helpful for council to know. But at this point, as I say, I, I wish this had gone a different way than referral. Uh, acting city uh, manager. Mr. Mr. Mayor and council, um, I'm happy to talk, go back and talk to staff. I'll send you uh, an email outlining our expected timeline to come back to. Sounds good? Okay? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And Councillor Reimer to close debate on the referral, or maybe it goes back to Councillor Deal. Councillor Reimer to on referral motion. Um, well, I will support the referral. I, I don't think that um, liquor policy is a, a fast track item, generally speaking. I think it's the sort of thing you want to do thoughtfully, and certainly we see that. Um, whenever these issues come before Council, and in fact, notable today that there's, despite I have not heard from one person that is for this, nor one person that is against this, which makes me think people just don't even know it's on the radar, so all the more important to be thoughtful about it. Um, I did, though, want um, some... There's been a contradiction in Councillor Affleck's statements. Um, in the motion, he suggests that we're behind other municipalities, which I have to admit was, frankly, a bit startling given that there's only been one council meeting since the province passed this, so it would surprise me if every other municipality had this on the agenda of their first meeting in September, but it is possible. Um, but then he did just say that we needed to get ahead of the other municipalities, so it would be helpful for me when staff do come back with this to have a better understanding of which municipalities have done this, because of course then if they had gotten right on it in the first council meeting after the province passed it, it'd be, they, there'd be some body of evidence there about what sort of impact it does have. It is a bit counterintuitive that uh, diluting the availability of local, uh, locally produced craft products would somehow support locally produced craft products, but I'm willing to suspend my disbelief there and, and use evidence to inform me moving forward. Thank you. Councillor Jang is next. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. And I'm, I'm going to, listening to the debate so far and certainly listening to the acting uh, city manager, has me wanting to support very much the um, referral. And for a couple of reasons. First of all, we heard that staff have been working very hard on, on a, a number of items. They may have uh, coming up not just one item for a quick start, but a package of items that may come up. And so good governance would say, gosh, just do it all at once and just give everybody a nice Christmas present, you know, not just piecemeal one after another. And I think attempts to paint it as not supporting, you know, referring it as, as not agreeing is, is just patently false and, and worthy of many, many uh, points of order because it's, uh, that, that's just patently false. And painted that way, I think, is just disingenuous and, and untrue. But liquor policy is, very, is a very serious thing. It's not just something you can do based on uh, what, uh, uh, say, for example, what businessmen would like. But there's also the health aspects as well. Liquor policy is, is developed in order to ensure that there is good controls over it, that, uh, that uh, there, well, marijuana is one, and this is why we went through this entire thing. And, um, well, you know, I, uh, this, is, this is exactly the point. You see, you just can't, uh, Council Affleck says, let's just, it'll be done tomorrow. I don't think it'll be done tomorrow, and it was passed because there's a whole period, there's a, a lot more work to be done. I would also like to hear about uh, how impacts of availability, other economic impacts, you know, does it leave it open for other products or, or whatever the case may be. So our staff are working very hard on this. Already, they have something that's almost ready to go. They have indicated that there is a package of, uh, of uh, quick starts for liquor policy change that comes soon. So good governance would suggest that we just hang on a bit uh, and uh, do it all at once. Because, you know, you just can't invent something on the fly. You have to really think it, and our staff, and this is what they're paid to do, and they're very skilled at doing it, doing that background check so we're not doing things piecemeal and having unintended consequences. And uh, as with marijuana, why did it take so long for us to come up with a policy and a bylaw? Well, it took two years, quite frankly, uh, to do that. And everybody thought you could just do it right away and it'd be easy to do. But no, there was a lot of unintended consequences, what we're doing, plus court cases and everything else, plus we had health. So it's very, very you know, I say, you know, there's going to be a package of something, likely, uh, before Christmas. So let's just let the staff do their job. It's well underway, and uh, let's just not be impulsive because you know that doesn't. That's not good policy making, and that's what exactly poor governance is: impulsive policy making. Thank you. Okay, 
So we're going to vote on this referral motion. Everyone's got the wording uh, on the screen. And we have votes in, 11 votes in, seven in favor, and Ball, Carr, Affleck, and DiGenova opposed. But the motion carries, so we will um, we will be seeing that uh, come back as part of quick starts in the liquor review before the holiday season. Well, that will be back in, in front of council, as per the wording in that. Referral motion. Okay, so we're done with uh, those motions and we're on to notice of motion, business inquiries and other matters. Two items of new business. The first is a request for leave of absence for Councillor Jang. Uh, meetings held October 20 to 22, October 27 and November 3 and 4, 2015. Uh, Councillor Stevenson will move a seconder. Councillor Reimer, all those in favor? Any opposed? And that carries. Uh, the second, maybe I'll double check with Councillor Carr. Do you still need that councillor carr uh, thank you. but communications one was uh, that makes the mood i don't need to okay yeah, thank Perfect. you so we will yeah. we will drop that one and uh, news thank business you. and i'll go to uh councillor deal did you have new business here councillor de genova did you have new business mr mayor uh are we doing them all together can i also bring forward a motion for the next meeting Yes, you can. usually all together, right? New business, inquiries, no yep. motion. All, Just wanted to clarify. One thing, yep. So I do have a, a motion to bring forward uh, entitled Exempt City Staff Severance Provisions, which I have sent to the clerk. Call notice. And then I have okay. some inquiries, Mr. Mayor. First of all, I was uh, a little bit troubled to see in the media uh, circulated a flyer uh, for an event hosted or uh, that featured Councillor Meggs titled Early Council. Uh, I'm not sure if this was a council meeting, but I was not as a councillor invited to this. I understand that it happened very early in the morning and I just wonder if perhaps staff could give us a legal opinion on councillors using the wording Early Council uh, at an event that we're speaking at or hosting, uh, especially if that event is hosted by a political party, if that may be misleading to the public that this actually is a council meeting. So that concerns me a little bit. Uh, I was not invited. I'm not sure if all of my other councillors were invited to this early council meeting, yeah, which yeah, asks yeah. for opinions on something that I believe will be going into a public hearing. So this concerns me a little bit. That being said, uh, I understand that I am the beneficiary of a briefing and actually there's a silver lining to this. I'm really looking forward to this briefing on the Senior Center. Thank you, Councillor Louis. Um, I'm just hoping that staff could schedule that at the earliest possible time that we could move forward with that briefing. And if an early council is allowed, maybe we could turn that into an early council, invite people to have coffee, muffins, join us for a briefing on the senior center. Just think that would be absolutely fabulous. That being said, a question that I had asked about months and months ago was the accept accessibility of our council chambers here. As the liaison to the Persons with Disabilities Advisory Committee, uh, it's come to my attention that it's difficult for people in wheelchairs. They cannot get into chambers by themselves here. There's nothing on the door that they can push to allow themselves access into council chambers. Staff sometimes are there to help them, and I know staff always try their very best, but in the absence of a staff person being outside. It's difficult for people with physical challenges uh, and seniors as those doors are quite heavy to get into the chamber. So if uh, staff could also work on that, I would very much appreciate it. Thank you very much. And just one last inquiry, and that is regarding affordable ownership and housing. Uh, I, I know that this is a policy that's moved forward through um, my motion entitled A Home for Everyone, looking at different uh, types of affordable housing, including micro suites, co-ops, and affordable ownership especially. And I was just hoping that staff could perhaps report back on when we might see an affordable ownership project moving forward to council. Thank you very much. Okay. We have a point of order. Um, Mr. Mayor, just a point of um, order in terms of these inquiries. And Councillor DiGenova has asked for a significant amount of report backs and work 
of staff and um, uh, introduced them as inquiries. Some of them, I think the uh, acting city manager could certainly provide in, in short order um, uh, in some instances, but others, I think, uh, uh, require more significant debate rather than accepting it on as a consensus that um, a legal opinion, for instance, is, is appropriate. And uh, I would call notice on all the various pieces or in fact, if we deal with it uh, today on the various pieces. Now, she had a long list of them, and so if uh, you know, I didn't, they wasn't able to write them all down in terms of what the Sorry. specific ask is, but I do have concerns about tasking our staff uh, with these inquiries and it's setting a pattern for, for council to then stand up and, and make a number of statements requesting information and then expecting that uh, it be performed because at a subsequent uh, meeting I expect Councillor DiGenovo or any councillor to say, well, where's that information I asked for? And so uh, uh, today I'll, I, I have issues. Point of order, with, Mr. With Chair. So, uh, Councillor Louis's uh, point of order uh, is uh, valid, and there are real concerns. Any requests that a councillor has that involve uh, the allocation of funding uh, obviously need to be vetted with council as a decision that's a departure from the budget that we've approved. Uh, if it's a quick feedback inquiry, that's the nature of uh, inquiries in this item on our agenda every every week as per council practice. So. Councillor DiGenova, you, you did have a number of items there that uh, involve significant staff work. So I think you, you, you'll need to parse out what you want answered by a quick question versus what you're going to try and bring forward to Council for approval of, uh, of allocation of funding. I will do that. Thank you very much. And, and also, I just wanted to bring forward, Mr. Mayor, that they were just updates. So I wasn't looking for a whole report, but I know a number of these issues uh, could just be answered in a simple email as especially the affordable ownership, the home ownership strategy, as to when we could anticipate a project coming to council or how many inquiries there are. So I just wanted to make sure that and the accessible door issue would at least be answered in a timely manner as I think that those are, are more looming and they, those are inquiries. Thank you. Okay. From uh, Councillor Genova's comments, that she's withdrawing the request for legal opinion. Could you just repeat that, Councillor Meggs? Well, like Councillor Louie, I understood that she was seeking a legal opinion. I'm happy to discuss with her the events, very innocuous events that she's referring to, but uh, I don't know. She now seems to be revising this, and I wonder if she's really seeking a legal opinion. I'm happy to withdraw the legal opinion and just discuss the events. We could we could do that if that saves staff time, and uh, I'll I'll take that offline. And and depending on the discussion I have with Councillor Meggs, I may or may not come forward with something. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Jang. Wow. How do I <laughs> follow up all that? Um, I said on a number of councils. I guess I can't use that word anymore. Gosh, research council can. Um, couple things. First, a question to our uh, acting city manager. Uh, we've had uh, two situations now in Vancouver's Chinatown where the murals have been uh, vandalized. Uh, and uh, it um, has starting, to, people are starting to worry that we're seeing uh, targeted hits or something like this. I know the Vancouver police are trying to find out who the, how the, who, who the uh, people are who, who did that. Uh, but I was just wondering if, if um, we could check in with staff to see whether or not there's some way we can help get those murals restored. I think the best way of defeating graffiti is uh, keep painting it over and keep, you know, letting you know it's not going to be tolerated. And uh, the longer we leave those, uh, you know, it's being interpreted as quite racist you know, attacks on the Chinese community. And uh, certainly I've heard a lot about it. So anything that we can do to help get those murals restored, repaired, or, or something as quickly as possible would be wonderful. Um, that would be great. Second item I wish to uh, talk a little bit about is report back a little bit on the Union of BC Municipalities meeting that was held here in Vancouver last week. I am the uh, Vancouver representative of it, and I'm glad to say all of my fellow colleagues came and participated in all the resolution sessions as well as the workshops. Uh, we had some uh, wonderful, uh, there was cabinet panels, for example, where we can line up and ask uh, the various uh, cabinet ministers of the province what they're up to, what they intend to do. Uh, but I think one of the most um, uh, a well attended sessions this year was the pre-conference workshop on marijuana dispensaries. It was packed and uh, certainly it also led to a resolution being passed that, uh, at the conference that uh, municipalities in the absence of any federal leadership on this issue uh, have the right and the ability to actually um, uh, start to regulate these things to keep our families and kids safe. 
Uh, but uh, it was a very successful conference. I know that uh, uh, we'll be, I know UBC will be reporting back on the amount of people came to Vancouver and the amount of hotel rooms and all that kind of stuff. But uh, really it was uh, great, great to see um, so many, all the municipalities across our province uh, can agree here in Vancouver and pass issues of common concern, whether it be uh, on climate change, whether it be on marijuana, whether it be on floods, you name it, it was all there. Uh, and it was very good. So we're just hoping now the province will respond in a positive way to some of these resolutions and um, we can build a better province together. Uh, lastly, I'd also like to uh, once again uh, raise that uh, we had uh, a major uh, uh, conference in mental health here in Vancouver. It's a very specialized conference. Uh, it's the International Leadership Convention on Mental Health and uh, folks from all over the world came to share ideas. And uh, it was very gratifying to see that uh, what we do here in Vancouver uh, is leading the way, whether it be the ACT teams work in Vancouver Police. Uh, we also heard about uh, different projects that are being done around the world, whether it be Sweden, New Zealand, Australia, the United States, and uh, they're bringing their learnings to us uh, as we adapt. So, and I think it was very nice to see as we saw that emergency room visits for mental health are, are, have actually started to stabilize a little bit, first time ever, as well as uh, the number of clients actually served using our new things, using the assertive care teams, uh, the assertive outreach teams, have actually started to make a difference on our streets. So um, with that, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Jang. And we'll go to Councillor Affleck. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, yes, you'd be saying it was great. There's a high moments there for uh, Councillor Jang, I'm sure, at uh, the marijuana decisions. Um, the, uh, I have I have a motion uh, that I put forward for uh, for the council here, uh, wine stores, you should have it all in front of you. I'll, I'll notice, Councillor. So uh, this is for the next council, I guess. Uh, wine stores aligning City of Vancouver liquor store guidelines with new provincial regulations. Uh, the uh, I can only imagine what the uh, referral will be at that time. I think it was uh, Councillor. So I look forward to uh, debating this um, at the next council. Thank you. Okay. So that's on notice for our next council meeting, and Councillor Reimer is next. Thanks, Mayor Robertson. A uh, few things. Um, first off, to Councillor DeGeneva's points around the accessibility of the doors, I actually was concerned about um, that follow up as well. So you can speak with us if you want to. I mean, you're always welcome to bring it to public council and ask. But Danica Jerkovic is the staff member in charge of that project. So it's always possible just to email her and get a response. Um, we can maybe touch base afterwards and I can let you know what she told me when I spoke with her a couple of weeks ago on it. Um, second thing was a question for the um, acting city manager. We had um, city staff recently remove three plaques that were part of a, a project related to a nonprofit foundation and the missing and murdered woman. Um, three plaques that were in, in memorial for three of the women that were murdered by Robert Picton were removed from the downtown east side in front of the Balmoral. I understand that um, con well, there was some confusion in the media which has caused some extreme distress for both the, three, the families of those three women but all of the families in the community that was impacted <laughs> by um, the missing and murdered woman issue. So my understanding is that the city notified all the families but did not notify necessarily the community groups and community members that have been very integral in raising awareness of the issue and memorializing the woman. Uh, Mr. Mayor and Council, that's accurate. We had, uh, our staff had notified and, and been in touch with the families, as you indicated. And I think there's work we could have done uh, better to engage with the, the public and the uh, interested organizations in the area with a, a, perhaps a meeting or a further engagement with them. So I think we've, we've learned some good lessons on that and uh, see some opportunities for improvement. Um, I, I have talked with um, social planning staff about some of those opportunities for improvement um, and I specifically wanted to flag for you and for council's uh, benefit because now as Councillor Lee pointed out would be the time if you're not okay with, with staff moving forward with this work. To me it would seem quite important that we get a protocol in place. Uh, so that when, with the community and the family. So I, I know the issue of a memorial is quite important to council and the city, um, but ensuring we have a protocol in place beforehand should such an occasion like this arise that we need to change something about it. 
Yes, I agree with you. I, th I think staff agree as well. So we're uh, we're working on that at this point, and uh, I've learned through this process that a protocol would really help, and and uh, perhaps more engagement as uh, both in the development of that, and then before pieces are um, installed. Thanks. Thank you. Um, to that, uh, and there is a vigil here at City Hall that had already been planned for October 4th as part of a National Day of Memorial for the Missing and Murdered Women. Um, I will be attending and offering my apologies to the family for families for any distress that we've caused them and community members, but of course raising the awareness of the issue is, is an integral um, part of getting action on it. A couple other things, doors open October 3rd. I know you all know that, um, but if you can get it out to your networks in the community, it is, uh, it's incredibly well subscribed, but it could always be like more people is better. The whole point of it is to get as many people as humanly possible into these spaces and to thank the Engage City Task Force for originally recommending it and uh, council for supporting bringing it forward because it is a very popular event in the city. And of course, this is our last meeting before the federal election. Um, I would be so very excited if the voter turnout in Vancouver was the highest voter turnout in the country. I'm, I'm quite certain all of you will be voting, but as much as we can get people, I don't know. This is it, because we have a Thanksgiving Thanksgiving break. holiday. Yeah, the next council meeting, just so we're all here, is on October 20th. So uh, that will be the day after the election on October 19th. So I uh, encourage you all to get out and vote, but more importantly, to get people that you know out to vote. Thank you. Councillor Carr is next. Uh, thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, I too just want to um, to thank all those people who are uh, who are involved in organizing the Union of BC Municipalities conference, which took place in our city last week. I, I saw all of you there. It was it was great. Um, uh, there was one uh, uh, um, session that I attended, uh, which I did want to follow up, and it was a session on emergency preparedness. Um, at, at which point Emergency Management BC indicated that in response to our concerns around the Marathasa, Marathasa oil spill and many other communities' concerns, they are proceeding with a um, new integrated uh, federal, provincial, regional and local government response plan um, to marine um, disasters. Um, response plan and preparedness plan and they have consultations they said that will be going on this fall and I, I wanted to inquire if uh, from our acting uh, city manager if we've been contacted about those yet. Acting city manager? I'm turning it on here. There you go. Um, Mr. Mayor and Council, since the Marathasa spill, as you know, and even before it, we've been ad advocating for a regional spill response plan. So this is something that uh, we've talked about. Certainly, Councillor Jang has been bringing it up for several years and uh, in conversations as it relates to the Coast Guard closure. So this has been, this is a drum we've been beating for a long time. So we have been engaging with the Coast Guard on it and uh, certainly will be engaging with them um, in the, the months ahead. Okay, just want to make sure that we are part of that consultation that they promised at the UBCM. Yes. Great, thanks. Um, at the UBCM also there was a very interesting workshop at which um, one of the presenters talked about caucusing. And I, in response to an earlier question by uh, Councillor Di Genova, I didn't receive a notice around an early council meeting uh, that was put on. And I do have concerns about the use of the word council. And they, it really twigged for me you know, with the UBCM report that say, saying that if there's a majority of councillors, so if there was a majority of vision councillors at that meeting, from my understanding of the report to UBCM or the questions made at UBCM, think there could be a problem with that. So I think some clarification I would like if Councillor um, Di Genova didn't quite get it um, after some interventions on that point. I would like to know about the use of the word council by any individual councillor to refer to a meeting that they might hold. Um, thirdly, I'd like to just ask another question, and this really is coming from individuals in Southeast Fraserlands. There was a meeting held Sunday. They're very concerned about the fact that when that Southeast Fraserlands area was, um, was uh, uh, rezoned residential from industrial, everybody knew, I guess, there was industrial activity on the south 
uh, side of the river in Richmond. But the hours of operation of those un industrial facilities was 9 to 5. And since then, it has been switched to 24-7. Um, so there are residents extremely concerned about the noise in particular, and some also about the smells that come from there. But noise was something that was really brought up. The movement of containers, um, the beep, beep, beeps, the, um, the hitting of containers one against the other. And I'm, I, I want to ask, it's not our jurisdiction, um, Richmond, but what advice can we give them? When, when citizens of our city approach us on this, what advice can we give them in terms of how they can proceed um, in terms of mitigating what has become really a quality of life, severe quality of life issue? That's uh, Mr. Mayor and Council. Some, I know we've done extensive work on it and have determined it's outside of our jurisdiction. In terms of what uh, advice we could give them, I, I need to circle back with you on that. My, my guess is probably through Metro Vancouver. But uh, yeah, um, it's obviously in the jurisdiction of Richmond. Um, so, but I'll, I'll get back to you if there's uh, opportunity for us to uh, advise them. Right, I would really appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Meggs. Well, Mr. Mayor, I'll just to reply briefly to some of the concerns that have been raised about a very successful activity undertaken uh, publicly by Vision of Vancouver two or three occasions now. Uh, under the term early council, which in my view could not be confused with city council, doesn't say Vancouver City Hall or council or anything else, uh, our organization invites uh, people to come and discuss current issues that are before council uh, publicly. Members of the media are welcome. Members of the NPA are welcome. Members of the Green Party are welcome. You may not be on our invite list, but that's probably because you haven't supported us in the past. But uh, if, if you want to be put in a special category, we could certainly arrange that. Um, I think that we should uh, be cautious, Mr. Merrill, just say this about uh, statements that are thrown out by people who may be trying to build up their law practice at the UBCM. Uh, you know, there's a, a, a right of councillors to sit and discuss business, which is in the public domain. I think. It would be strange if we didn't, uh, when we received the council package, talk to our colleagues about it, of all parties. I know I talked to Councillor Affleck in advance of some votes, Councillor Ball on other occasions, Councillor Carr on others, and I talked to my vision colleagues as well. And uh, we have a legal opinion now, I believe everyone in council has seen it, assessing some of the uh, existing law in this regard. And I think the uh, biggest mistake we could make is panic and undermine democratic processes here at the city because I value very much uh, the uh, discussions that occur after these matters are in the public domain and posted on the website that I can have with various people, both uh, members of council and unelected people. So I just wanted to flag that about that debate. I don't think that that uh, intervention of the UBCM signaled a fundamental change in anything. It's one person's take uh, as they seek to raise their own profile and people are entitled to do that, but you know, there's, uh, there's other views out there. I know that every party that's held a majority at this city hall has had caucus meetings uh, forever and and you know there's no there's no secret about that and I don't think that uh, the existence of those conversations undermined anything so you know I think we're gonna have to take a look and uh, and assess all that and I would uh, just say that if other organizations want to use the term council uh, for whatever reason uh, you know council of wildlife eaters or whatever it is uh, they they're welcome to do so so you know it's a it's a public event uh, by public invitation, open to the media. Uh, there was one uh, that uh, Councillor Stevenson did, I think, regarding uh, Pride and some of uh, the activities he's been involved in in that front. We had one on housing. We've had one now on the viaducts. And in each case, uh, we rely entirely on public information. And it's, it's indicated that it's a public gathering for conversation, and it's wide open to whoever wants to walk in the door. Uh, our own organization pays the entire freight, and uh, that's the way it goes. So uh, no, the $10 is waived for anybody who can't. But, but you know what? It's, if they want to give ten dollars, that's no problem. And so uh, it's well, it's a Vision Vancouver event. You know, I don't think this, uh, Councillor Did you know? But they, often things are raised in a way that there's some mystery or secrecy behind them. And I want to be absolutely clear. I know that there's a grave concern around transparency around the table, as there should be. And this has been an utterly transparent and open arrangement. And I expect that other political parties will do everything they can to be accountable to their members. At least uh, that would be my hope and members of the public at large. So uh, if there's any further questions, I'm happy to meet uh, with folks and have further conversations about that. And, uh, and I'll certainly be reading the latest information we received from our legal counsel here at the city based on that UBCM intervention. 
Thanks, Councillor Mays. Councillor Ball? Yes, thank you very much. Um, I actually wasn't going to address this issue, but I appreciate Councillor Meigs uh, bringing it to the fore. Um, I do find it confusing and did find it confusing when um, a citizen forwarded the invitation to me uh, in which the body of the letter referred very clearly to City Council and then the invitation referred to Early Council. So I think there was a confusion in the, in the public because I did receive a, a request to clarify this. And uh, I, I do not think it's appropriate to use Vancouver City Council or City Council in the same letter and in the same body as uh, referring to a made-up Early Council. So I, I will leave that as it is. But um, tonight is a very special night. Uh, many citizens have been looking forward to the unveiling of the Vancouver Art Gallery design, and there will be a celebration tonight at the Queen Elizabeth Theatre. I believe that tickets are available on the Vancouver Art Gallery website, and it should be an exciting evening as they unveil to the City of Vancouver their plans for moving forward with a brand new art gallery. I hope to see you all there. Thanks, Councillor Ball. Councillor Louie. <clears throat> Um, a few things. Yes, uh, this is the last council meeting before the federal election, so I'll take the opportunity as president of the FCM just to encourage everyone on council and, in fact, our general public to be more engaged. That uh, we have created a website, FCM, uh, at the FCM, uh, hometownproud.ca. I encourage you to go uh, on the website to look at the policy tracker that's been created that tests the. Uh, promises that are being made, the commitments that are being made by the various parties against the roadmap that was created by the FCM, specifically related to municipal issues. Uh, it is a good tool, I think, for both of us, both us elected and for the citizens to go on the site and have a look and see whether or not the parties match up with your expectations of what the federal government should be doing um, and decide based on that information. Uh, We've also asked the political parties, all their candidates, to sign the uh, Canadian Municipal Commitment at hashtag Canadian Muni. And uh, we've had some pretty good uptake that uh, the number of parties have signed up. The Green Party is currently in the lead with, uh, with the most candidates that have, uh, that have signed. The NDP is in close second. The Liberals are in third. And uh, the, while well, the Conservatives have, uh, last I looked, they have three. So. Take the opportunity, I, I state this, not to uh, embarrass any of the parties. Uh, we're going to continue to want to, um, to have them sign and put them on record on how they would uh, help local governments across our nation uh, better serve our citizens, improve the quality of life of our citizens. And when you interact in the, these next intervening few weeks um, at, at political events or uh, public announcements and you see a candidate, please ask them to make that commitment. This is in our uh, interest here in Vancouver, but of course interest of uh, all the cities and, and towns and rural, rural folks uh, across our entire nation. So it's important that uh, we do our part as leaders of, uh, at, uh, at the local level to, to take this challenge on. Uh, I do have an update in regards to the uh, task force on Syrian issues of the Syrian refugees. Uh, the FCM had con has uh, convened on, on my uh, advice to the board. Uh, I'm pleased to report that we will be making an announcement on the makeup of that task force and, and our efforts uh, on that tomorrow. Uh, but before, just a teaser, uh, Councillor Meggs has agreed to sit as the uh, task force member on behalf of Vancouver City Council. Thank you for that. I've uh, made that ask and uh, Councillor Meggs has answered the call. Uh, lastly, I just want to wish everyone a, a mid-autumn festival, you know, Happy mid autumn Festival. It happened on Sunday, but uh, for some of us, uh, we celebrate a few extra days. And, uh, and I, I apparently need to buy some moon cake for Councillor Reimer. <laughs> but, uh, and if any one of you would like to partake, I would be happy to go and get you one as well. But, but it's, uh, it's important that uh, we do spend time with family. This is the, uh, this is the largest celebration um, for, uh, for the Asian community, and I think it's important for us to, to look, think about the base of that, which is to spend time with family and friends and reflect upon the, um, the benefits uh, that we've received in life and uh, how we can do uh, better for others around us as well. Thank you, Mr. Mayor.
Thank you, Councillor Louie. And that is all for our notice of motion, business inquiries, and other matters. So we uh, just need a motion to adjourn this council meeting. Councillor Ball will adjourn, uh, move adjournment. Councillor Jang will second. All those in favor? Any opposed? And that carries. So this meeting is adjourned, and council will meet in camera uh, starting at, did we say 2.15? 2.15, sharp. We have staff.